The Royal Commission is now resumed. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to start uh, by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Iora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, those of us in Sydney uh, are uh, sitting today, and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations people who may be viewing this uh, public hearing. Yes, Ms Eastman. Uh, good morning, Commissioners and those following the proceedings of the Royal Commission. We're starting earlier this morning at 9.30. The plan is to uh, take the morning tea adjournment a little bit earlier at 11am and then resume at 11.15am. And from 11.15, Dr Melifont will have the conduct of the proceedings during the day. So, Commissioners, I may ask to be excused at that point in time. Certainly. Uh, Commissioners, can I start with our witness this morning, Professor Anne Kavanagh? Yes, can we bring Professor Kavanagh up on the screen, please? Good morning, Professor Kavanagh. Thank you for joining us. Um, first, I'll ask you, please, to take the oath or affirmation so my associate will explain what is needed. Thank you. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, Ms Eastman will now ask you some questions. Professor Kavanagh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Professor Kavanagh. Can I start by confirming that you are Anne-Marie Kavanagh? Yes. And you are the Chair of Disability and Health at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health? Yes. You've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission dated the 12th of August? Yes. And are the contents of the statement true? Yes. I think there's a few dates in the statement where we may vary by a day or so, but we'll correct those dates as we oh, go through. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, commissioners, uh, can I just deal with the formalities? A copy of Professor Kavanagh's statement you'll find in the tender bundle part B behind tab 22, and I'll ask you to mark the statement exhibit 5.30. Professor Kavanagh's CV appears at tab uh, 23 and then there are a number of exhibits including publications and you'll find those documents in Tender Bundle Part D at tab 97 to 110 and Commissioners, if you could mark those exhibits 5.30.1 through to 5.30.15. Yes, thank you. Professor Kavanagh, can I start with your professional background? As you've said, you are currently the Chair of Disability and Health, but you're also the Head of the Disability and Health Unit at the Centre of Health Equity at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, and that's a role that you've held since March 2018. Yes. You are also the co-director and lead investigator on the Centre of Research Excellence in Disability and Health, and that's a role that you've held since November 2016. Yes. You have been appointed to a number of advisory committees for both state and federal governments. Yes. And uh, you are, by training, uh, a medical practitioner and you're an epidemiologist with a medical degree from Flinders University and a PhD from the Australian National University. Yes. You've provided to the Royal Commission a copy of your CV with a very extensive list of publications and research papers. Is that right? Yes. Right. And can I say, Commissioners, I won't trouble you taking you through Professor Kavanagh's research work set out in her CV, but it is extensive. 
Professor Kavanagh, can I ask you about your current areas of research? Your research focuses on the health of people with disability and you focus on how social determinants such as employment, housing, poverty and education influence the health of people with disability? Yes. And your work identifies potential policy solutions to reduce disability-related socioeconomic and health disadvantage. Yes. Part of your research work has focused on the operation of the NDIS and impact on disability support worker workforce, is that right? Yes. And your work also focuses on violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability with a concentration on data. Yes. And your work also takes an approach of focusing on the intersections of gender and other socioeconomic determinants and health outcomes. Yes. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has certainly put a very sharp focus on both your research work and also the demands on you to participate in a large number of advisory committees. Is that right? Yes. Right. And during the course of this time, notwithstanding those demands, you have published a number of um, uh, either opinion pieces or research papers during the course of COVID-19 focusing on particular issues. Is that right? Yes. Now, um, there are probably a myriad of issues that we could discuss with you this morning, but I want to focus on the six key issues that you've identified in your statement. But before I do that, can I bring you back perhaps to um, your role as a medical practitioner and epidemiologist? We've had a lot of uh, discussion over the last few days about COVID-19, but we haven't had anybody with relevant health expertise to tell us what is COVID-19, how do we understand it in terms of a disease? So can I ask you that first? And then secondly, uh, um, it would be of assistance to the Royal Commission to understand what COVID-19 means in the context of a public health response as opposed to responses that might be individualised. So could I start by asking you to just school us a little bit in the the science and the uh, medicine of COVID-19. Okay. Um, I don't pretend to be any um, big expert on this, but um, I so um, COVID-19 is actually the name of the illness that's caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2, which is related. People remember the SARS uh, pandemic. Um, SARS-CoV-2 stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus um, and it's and and so COVID-19 is actually the illness that comes from that if you like SARS-CoV-2 is the bug um, so it and and as we know it first emerged in Wuhan in China in late December um, and then we had our first case in January 2020 um, so it's a highly infectious virus um, and it causes quite a good degree of morbidity and death. So we were. It, so it was. Um, it was always a worry for um, infectious disease uh, clinicians and infectious disease epidemiologists who saw very early that it, the potential for it to be a pandemic. And of course, there's no at that point in time. It's a new virus. That's what's called a novel virus. Um, so there's no effective vaccine or treatment. Um, and so the only way you can reduce transmission um, from uh, of SARS-CoV-2 in the community is to take a public health response to prevent an exponential rise in cases that you would get if you didn't put those containment measures in place. So when you're talking about a public health response, um, what, so what, does what, what, what does that mean? So what we're trying to do is restrict people's contact um, and restrict people's contact with people who could potentially have infection. That's the gap. That's the main game. So that's why we introduce things like restrictions on travel, closed borders. There are recommendations now, which everyone's aware of, around physical distancing, personal hygiene, washing your hands, wiping down services, and so forth, which are to to 
prevent the spread of it. Um, and of course, we close things like schools and workplaces to reduce um, people's contact with each other. Importantly, um, it's a, a testing and contact tracing remains um, an important part of this pandemic. So if someone does be, is found infected, that they're, um, that they're isolated so they can prevent infection among others. Um, so th those are the main um, public health measures. So it requires everyone in the population to participate in reducing the spread of this virus. So Professor Kavanagh, the, a public health response means that there has to be uniform rules and procedures across the country rather than tailored for particular <coughs> groups at particular circumstances. Is that right? Well, of course, in that we've seen in Australia now that we have different public health responses across the country, which is based on the levels of community transmission. Um, on the whole, we do need to have a fairly consistent approach across the whole population, yes, recognising that um, sometimes that's not possible for particular groups in the same ways. Um, and people with disabilities might be one of those groups where we need to think about how we can protect, uh, have a, a good public health response while balancing individual um, uh, needs. What we've heard over the course of the evidence of the past two days is that the uniform public health measures have had a greater impact on people with disability and in your statement you addressed from paragraph 39 the increased risks faced by people with disability in COVID-19. So the first bit is a higher degree of risk for people with disability but the second part is a higher and greater impact on people with disability with respect to the public health measures and this mm -hmm. has been part of the research that you've undertaken over the last six months in responding to COVID-19. So can I ask you, just in terms of the increased risk that you've set out in the statement, first of all, you've said that Australians with disability are, at, are an at-risk population because they have many other health conditions. And so I think we've heard this expression comorbidity. Is that what that's intended to yes, cover? Yes, yes, um, that's exactly what it's intended to cover. And the second is that people with disability, particularly people with complex needs, require personal support that puts them in close contact with other people. And so this is the point that a measure that might be applied across the whole of the community in relation to physical distancing might create a greater challenge for people with disability because it just may not be possible. Is that right? Yes, yes. And so if it's not possible, then the question is, how can you either adapt or adjust a general rule to specifically deal with the needs of a person with disability if close contact is essential to managing complex needs? Is that right? Yes. The other um, issue that you've identified, this is paragraph 41, is that some people with disability live in group homes or attend respite services and many different workers will provide support to people living in these settings, sometimes moving between multiple homes and services. And you say the potential for spread of SARS-CoV-2, it may be higher because of the wide networks and difficulty with physical distancing, with potential issues concerning personal hygiene. So this is something that we've heard some evidence coming out of the Aged Care Royal Commission, are there any similarities from what we hear about the issues in aged care for people with disability living in group homes or attending respite services? Well, of course, we've got a very similar situation in terms of having a number of people living together. Um, uh, and we have the same situation where we have people, um, the workers moving between um, uh, potential different settings, like you said, and some of that may be they're working, say, in a group home, but then they might also be providing support in the home, or they might even indeed be working in a day program as well, where you have a number of people with disabilities together in that context. Um, so 
the other issue which I think will come to later probably is the issues around the workforce itself and the casualised nature of that workforce. Um, but um, I, I think that those are the ways in which it does, is similar to aged care. Um, traditionally, not as many people in those settings, although um, we have seen in Victoria um, uh, outbreaks in uh, supported residential services, which are somewhat bigger than group homes and often have people with mental health issues and um, intellectual disabilities. So um, that's another um, uh, setting where there are dozens of people um, living and potentially at risk. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit, um, one issue you identify in paragraph 46 is the lack of healthcare professionals with specific expertise in the healthcare of people with disabilities and low levels of existing skills in healthcare workforce related to disability. And this places people with disability at a risk of poor healthcare if they're infected with COVID-19. Um, have you seen this, how have you seen this uh, work in the COVID-19 experience? Have the lack of expertise resulted in any particular outcomes in terms of healthcare for, for people with disability? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the extent to which that has been a, a problem. So, um, you know, I've had some um, anecdotal evidence, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, um, I don't actually know the extent, although it is a risk and um, uh, that particularly around um, assumptions around discrimination that people bring to their decision making um, and very early on concerns about people being de with disabilities being deprioritised for care in the healthcare sector, um, but also a recognition that sometimes um, issues like uh, the hospitals not allowing visit someone else to accompany you into the hospital was a real risk for people with disabilities who might need someone else to su help support them through that system. And here in Victoria, there has been uh, uh, a, a directive that um, people with disabilities should be able to have someone accompany them if they want to through the healthcare journey, particularly in a hospital. And so that's, that's a good thing. One uh, issue the Royal Commission heard in its hearing into access to healthcare services for people with cognitive disability earlier this year was the concept of diagnostic overshadowing. Yes. Has that, has that uh, arisen in your research during the course of COVID-19? I, I have to say I haven't actually researched people's interactions with the health system, um, so I wouldn't be able to comment on it. But, of course, we were um, very concerned that that may well be the case. All right. Now, uh, again, I'm going to jump ahead. At paragraph 71, this is page 13 of your statement, you set out under the heading Key Issues and Themes six key or I think seven key issues. Uh, the final one includes your personal experiences, and I'm going to ask the commissioners to read that part of your statement. We won't deal with that today. So can I focus on the six key issues, and I'll work through each of them. Uh, the first is you've said that you believe the response of governments was relatively slow despite the known potential risks for people with disability in emergency situations. So that's the first issue. Uh, it's the case, isn't it, that on the 16th of March this year, yes. uh, you were part of uh, a, a group of uh, academics and researchers to write to government to express your concerns about government's seemingly inaction in relation to responding to the rights of people with disability. Is that right? And I can direct your attention to paragraph 51 of your statement where I think you deal with this. Yes, we did. So you made a, a, a number of recommendations in this first um, response. Do you want to tell the Royal Commission what prompted the inquiry, uh, what prompted the statement of concern and what were the recommendations that you sought to raise and commissioners a copy of this document appears in the tender bundle 
in Part D, uh, the final volume at uh, tab 97. I don't need to put that one up on the screen at the present time, um, but you were identifying in that document that the health sector was underprepared to meet the urgent needs of people with disability. There was a concern about the disability service sector not being able to meet the care needs of people with disability. Information was not accessible and you made two recommendations. The first was rapid, rapidly scaling up the healthcare sector's capacity to care for people with disability and secondly, rapidly increase the capacity of disability care workforce to respond to the pandemic and its consequences. Uh, with respect to that first statement of concern back on the 16th, 15th or 16th of March, did you receive any response from any governments in relation to those concerns? Um, I think... It, I, I sent the statement to, um, to the NDIA, the National Quality and Safeguard Commission, the, um, and the Commonwealth Government at that time, um, and did receive, uh, and ministers, relevant ministers, and did receive responses um, acknowledging receipt of it. And I did then start to have conversations more broadly with people within the Commonwealth Department of Health at about that time, just after that time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but I think Ms Eastman asked you also what prompted you to issue the oh, statement. Okay. Would, would, you, would you mind responding to that question? Thank you. Um, well, I was basically... Uh, our group, the CRE in Disability and Health and um, at the University of Melbourne, um, are interested in the health of people with disabilities. So really we, we saw that um, this was a perfect storm um, uh, and that really the um, people with disabilities were at risk um, for the reason we've talked about and that we weren't observing a response from government in the same way as we had in the aged care sector um, at that point. Um, and um, a plan developed for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, we were deeply concerned at that point that there was a lack of acknowledgement of the particular risks of people with disabilities and a lack of preparation for how we might respond to that, um, to that problem. Thank you. The, the following week, a second statement of concern was issued, and that was on... I think you've said in your statement the 26th, but the date of the document is the 24th. Yeah. Uh, and I'll ask that that one will be brought up on the screen. Right. Now, can I ask you, first of all, what prompted uh, the issuing of this second statement of concern? And then I'll turn to the recommendations. Well, we still weren't seeing the kind of response we we wanted, um, and uh, we wanted to make some more specific recommendations uh, to government about how they could respond to this situation. Um, and from the previous response, others other people had also pointed out some issues that that perhaps we could have dealt with more in the in in the first response. Um, and one of the key reasons we were we pushed in this particular um, statement of concern was the need to establish some sort of expert advisory committee, bringing the disability and health sectors together, advocates um, uh, and um, experts from academia, clinical workforce, so forth, to to rapidly mount a coherent public health response. Um, so that was an amazing. A, a, um, one of the things that we were deeply concerned about at that time, we were worried that um, people with disabilities um, needed to think about healthcare planning, weren't getting um, information that was specific to their needs. Um, there was little information at that time around whether they should be using uh, personal protective um, um, equipment and there was also a lack of um, acknowledgement I think that um, the disability support workforce were actually essential services as and, um, healthcare and aged care had been named as at that time. 
And the, the document has um, two strong recommendations. Can I ask you about the first recommendation? And perhaps if we can just highlight that it's the shaded box. Just oh, up. yes, um, that we recommended that um, that we that a committee is established um, that National Cabinet establish a committee of expert advisors um, and um, uh, knowledgeable in disability and health services. I think the the issue we were we've been worried about all along is that this is a public health emergency. Um, and that it needs a coordinated health and uh, disability response. They, they can't be siloed responses. Um, then, so, yes. So that, that was the sort of overarching recommendation and then you set out some detail in terms of recommendation for healthcare and people with disability and recommendation for the disability workforce. Yes. All right. Now, in terms of any response from government to... That statement of concern, it's the case, isn't it, that by the 2nd of April, the Commonwealth set up an, an advisory committee? Yes. And Mr Cottrell from the Department of Health is the chair of that committee? Yes, he is. And he has said in his statement uh, that the role and responsibilities of the committee are as follows. The committee will provide expert advice to inform the development of the plan, and that's a, a plan that will be the management and operational plan for people with disability. Yes. So expert advice to inform the development of the plan on the healthcare needs of people with disability, their families and the disability service sector, including access to COVID-19 screening, prevention and health care, and secondly, to oversee the implementation of the plan. And committee members may be expected to share information on the progress of the work undertaken. However, it will be clarified from time to time whether the information is confidential for committee purposes only. So there was a, a timing set out in terms of the preparation of the plan and the membership of that committee included a number of people such as yourself and Professor Julian Troller, is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, with respect to the work that you were required to do to provide expert advice on the development of the plan and to oversee the implementation of the plan, Noting that there is the rider about what was confidential and what was not, what can you tell the Royal Commission about your role on that committee and the development of the plan? And the Royal Commission has heard that the plan was confirmed by National Cabinet on the 16th of April and then released on the 17th of April. What can you tell us about the process of the development of the plan? Um, I the um, it was led through the Department of Health, but there was a lot of input from the committee, um, and uh, they led the writing of the plan, but were very open um, and directed by the committee, and also what the committee members were hearing from the community. Um, so it was very much a collaborative effort, um, and I would say um, they had. Most, many of the recommendations did come uh, for what should be done, did come from committee members. Do you feel that the uh, recommendations and issues you had identified in the statements of concern on the 16th of March and the 24th of March uh, formed part of the development of the plan? Yes, I do. Noting, of course, that one of the things about this committee is it was about the healthcare response. And so in some ways, um, again, we have that issue where we have um, uh, limitations in what that committee can do in terms of responding in the, the to the disability service sector. So um, it very much concentrated on uh, the healthcare response. Um, having said that, um, uh, the, there were representatives from um, the NDIA, the Quality and Safeguard Commission, um, uh, and, um, and DSS, as well as uh, state governments. 
um, on that committee and questions that overlapped with other sectors were taken back to those relevant departments. But the plan was a health plan. Right. You, you've remained a, a member of that committee and Mr Cottrell will tell the Royal Commission tomorrow that up to the 28th of July there's been 12 meetings of the advisory committee and a number of broader roundtables. So you've participated in all of those meetings? Oh, I, I can't um, say whether I've participated in all of them. I think I've participated in the great majority. It would be either 11 or 12, but I may have missed one meeting. I, I don't, I can't recall. So one of the tasks of the committee is the implementation of the plan. Uh, and I, I want to ask you this because... On the 22nd of April, uh, you published uh, another uh, piece of work indicating that the plan did not go far enough for people with disability in congregate settings, and you've set that out at paragraph 55 of your statement. Mm -hmm. uh, can we take it that the concerns that you had about the plan and its application to people in congregate settings uh, may indicate that you were had some criticism of the plan in terms of the extent to which it covered people with disability in a range of settings. Can I ask you, were there other concerns that you had with the plan um, in its form as at the 17th of April? I think, um, I think the main issue with the plan was more that it was uh, at a... Um, perhaps understandably at a very high level um, and so how um, some of the things could be implemented were were going to be difficult um, and again this arises from the issue of having a plan where the commitment comes from everyone on that committee to the implementation of that plan so my criticism there around congregate settings is um, that uh, there there wasn't enough direction um, but partly who the responsibility in terms of who makes those, those calls about congregate settings. Um, I think there were still a lot of issues around access to PPE and, 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 and a lack of clarity uh, at that time around what the recommendations should be for that workforce. Um, and we, we took a, that took a while to resolve um, for that committee. Um, so I think the plan could have gone further in relation to perhaps groups that were at higher, at particularly high risk and, and um, <coughs> people in congregate settings, but also um, the capacity for us to influence things like how do you pay the disability support workforce when they're sick? <laughs> and how do you take away uh, those kinds of questions? And I, I think part of the issue with the plan was um, it wasn't clear where the roles and responsibilities for the implementation of the recommendations and actions um, were. Right. But, but overall, you've expressed that the fact of the plan was a positive measure. Yes. And it was welcomed at the time. Yes. And uh, so you're not critical of the fact that a plan was developed. Mm -hmm. No. But if you have criticisms, it's really that the plan was brought together very speedily, but it needs to evolve and be responsive to the needs of people with disability as the pandemic continues. Is that right? Yes. And there has been a revision, one revision of the plan, and the plan's currently going under another revision. Um, and that that uh, latter revision um, reflects um, one of my concerns and others' concerns that we don't have a uniform response anymore across Australia, um, that in particular in Victoria where there's very high, well, where there's high levels of community transmission, that the response will have to be different. Um, and so we really need to think through how we have a plan that can move forward to, um, to deal with the fact that we're dealing with very different scenarios across Australia. And um, well, I I think the concerns that you raised about the congregate settings uh, back in April, uh, you've really seen come to the fore in Melbourne where there's much higher rates of infection and there have been outbreaks in congregate settings in Melbourne 
and we haven't seen the same level of outbreaks in comparable settings across the rest of Australia. What what do you think is the, the either the reason behind that, but more importantly, how do you respond to a more acute situation in Melbourne uh, and does the plan address that in any way? No, no, it doesn't at the moment and that's why it needs to be revised. Um, remembering, of course, that the response um, then becomes a state government response as well. So there's a lot of players in this in this response. Um, but, of course, the plan doesn't cover the current situation in Victoria um, and needs to be rapidly changed uh, to do that. The congregate settings, like you said, that was my great fear um, in um, March, in April. And one of the things I think that we haven't touched on yet was in it, in it and it hasn't happened as far as I know, with, with the settings like day programs and supported accommodation services as well. Yes. Um, and uh, But there still remains a potential in those settings for um, high levels of transmission. Um, yes, unfortunately, what I worried about in April has come to bear. Well, can I put this to you? It, the, the starting point of the plan in April was very much the Commonwealth's response but yeah. over the course of the pandemic, uh, the plan itself has highlighted where there are gaps between what are matters of Commonwealth responsibility and powers and what become more localised response need from either state governments, territory governments, or even, for that matter, local government areas. And from your perspective, how do you manage this in terms of, of planning? As you know, we're only looking and our focus is the Commonwealth, but uh, your yeah. work seems to highlight the fact that the pandemic itself doesn't say, well, this is the Commonwealth, this is the state, <laughs> no. and we'll work around it that way. Well, that's actually what I would like to say. I, to some extent, I don't care whose responsibility it is. I just want them all to work together and, and come up with the best response because that's clear. Um, even the Commonwealth is slightly more complicated than you, you raise because within the Commonwealth is the Department of Health there's DSS, there's NDIS, NDIA, and there's the National Quality and Safeguarding Commission as players in this. Um, and uh, and my point is that they really need to work in in um, very closely together um, to uh, to optimise the public health response and while protecting the rights uh, of people with disability in the, in the pandemic. Um, and then at a state level, you also have the Department of Health, but you also have, um, and what we've seen in Victoria is um, where we've had group homes that still remain under the regulation of the state government and some that are NDIA and, and covered by the National Quality and Safeguarding Commission. So it, it is a complex um, situation, but people with disabilities um, really require those, all of those parts of government to work very closely together and to rapidly develop um, their, their resources within their own states. But also I think the key thing now and what we've seen is in Victoria is that they need to develop an emergency response strategy uh, should COVID-19 break out. Um, and uh, that's only happened in Victoria in the last few weeks. I'm sorry again if I may ask a question. Uh, I think we can accept the coronavirus probably hasn't read the Australian Constitution, but I wonder whether anybody within this committee or in the deliberations you've been party to turned their mind to whether the Commonwealth itself could take control of this entire problem. The entire problem for people with disabilities or coronavirus? No, coronavirus plus people with disability. Well, I, I can't answer more generally. I mean, the National Cabinet, I think, and the um, Australian Health Protection Committee was some attempt to do that um, at a Commonwealth level, but still ultimately responsibilities around, say, public health directions and so forth remained a state responsibility. Um, I think there has not been enough of that, uh, that um, cross-jurisdictional, cross um, uh, government um, uh, response, um, and we um, we are seeing um, some of that the fault lines in that um, arising in this pandemic. Um, yes, uh, so I think 
it, while we sat around the same table, we did sit around the same table and there was a level of collaboration that perhaps I haven't seen before. I don't think, I think it could go further. Yes, thank you. But part of the concern about uh, the escalation of the emergency in Victoria led to a third statement of concern that was issued on the 13th or 14th of July. Yes. And I might uh, just call that one up because this was a recommendation on a tailored COVID-19 response for people with disability. Can we bring that document up? All right, so we turn to the next page. There are a number of recommendations here which start to address that uh, problem of who has responsibility, so who is in control. And one of the recommendations which you'll see uh, highlighted in the shaded box there is that there needed to be some immediate actions taken and the first was the proactive community outreach to households and a suggestion that community workers could reach out to individual households to provide immediate care and a range of matters that are then set out on the rest of that page as dot points. And the second was specific health care and social welfare initiatives that could include a range of measures to ensure that testing could be done for people with disability in an appropriate manner. The third recommendation over the page was the provision of disability services and some of these recommendations related to the NDIA and the local area coordinators reaching out to all participants to assess whether an urgent plan review was required and you also make some recommendations about the Victorian government working proactively with the NDIA and the Quality and Safeguards Commission uh, and a range of dot points there. And then the final recommendation was in relation to the health of children and young people with disability returning to education. Yes. So these are very specific recommendations which were prompted by the acute situation in Victoria. Uh, Professor Kavanagh, for us reading these recommendations, it seemed that there needed to be planning for when emergencies became acute and localised. Yep. And they reached a point where that localised, I think some of the words used are clusters and localised areas, but there needed to be quite detailed emergency planning where there were very high rates of infection. And if the lockdown stage four situation that we now see in Victoria spreads more generally around Australia as a, a mechanism to address the ongoing infection, you have to have very almost bespoke yes. uh, responses. Is that, that, that was my understanding of reading this material, like even getting to the level of uh, school staff being trained in particular degree of infection control or how families would look to individualised plans and, and matters of those kind. Yes, I think what um, this state, what, what Melbourne showed, um, has showed and continues to show is um, that you can't have a one size fits all approach. But I also think, um, I, I think this this um, emerged after we saw um, the outbreaks in the Housing Commission flats um, and uh, we were worried about people with disabilities living in those um, Housing Commission um, estates uh, because, and, and one of the things we we're also worried about is to some extent we concentrated a lot on NDIS participants but there were a lot of people um, living in these settings that uh, that weren't NDIS participants, and we didn't know who they were, um, and we don't didn't necessarily have a plan for each of those people to how to support them if they go into social if they have to isolate as 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 they were in in the um, public housing estates in quite 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 um, small um, uh, environments with many people sometimes in one flat. Um, and so we were very worried about the immediate 
uh, health and social welfare needs. And some of that doesn't relate to their risk of COVID-19. Some of that relates to um, mental health needs, um, whether issues around um, people being socially isolated leads to an escalation of um, behaviours of concern um, and, uh, and exposes people to risks of um, abuse and neglect. The other issue I think that's become very obvious for me, um, and it's also um, obvious in terms of the response to culturally and linguistically diverse, um, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, is that it's all very well to produce easy read material and so forth and put it on a website, but that doesn't mean that someone's gonna get it. And so I was deeply concerned um, that people weren't actually getting the information they needed and so believed that a much more proactive community outreach approach was needed. Um, and in some instances, that would require actually door knocking. Um, so I, I, we, we were terribly concerned at that point that people were being left behind in, in that response. Um, and so that, that's why we made those suggestions. We also wanted to ensure that testing was accessible, um, recognising that some people couldn't necessarily go to a testing site. And we've now seen um, only in the last week or so the possibility of in-home testing. Saliva testing doesn't seem to be taking off um, for a variety of reasons, I think. So um, it still remains a, a challenge for testing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think we really believed the need to, to think very carefully about people uh, in Victoria, um, particularly those living in very disadvantaged circumstances um, who had a disability. Um, the school settings uh, continued to be a concern. Um, I was particularly worried, for instance, on... Um, when children were going to special schools on special school buses um, and the potential for them, who, many of them sitting next to each other, some of them, um, you know, 17 and 18 year olds, so effectively the same as adults, uh, issues around personal hygiene um, and, you know, uh, and that continues to concern me. Um, and it's been an issue I've raised um, a number of times with the education department. Um, so I think, and, and again, uh, infection control in a school setting being particularly difficult in uh, potentially in a special school setting um, where issues um, around some of the children and young people in those settings being having finding it difficult to either understand the information or um, comply, so comply in inverted commas with, um, with uh, 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 personal hygiene recommendations. Right, can I move to the sorry? Can move to the second issue that you identified, and um, it, it flows from what you've just been saying, and that is the issue about the availability of data and transparency in data. So you've identified this in paragraph seventy-two of the statement, and deal with it in a little more detail in paragraphs eighty-nine to one hundred. Can I ask you this? Do you know? How many people with disability have been infected with COVID-19 since the 22nd of January? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> Do you know how many people with disability have died because of a corona or COVID-related um, illness since the 22nd of January? No, I don't. Do you know if there is any data that would be available to <coughs> the Royal Commission that would tell the Royal Commission how many people with disability have been infected with COVID-19 or who have died as a result of the virus? There, I think this is where there is a major issue. Um, so the only data that I'm aware of at the moment um, is the data reported to the National Quality and Safeguarding Commission. Um, where services have reported cases um, to the Commission. Um, and, uh, and I should point out, we also would want um, the cases amongst the disability support workforce as well. Uh, it's a terribly important um, number to have to understand transmission. Um, we, uh, that some services will be reporting that. Um, 
to my mind, I, I'm not clear that they are getting a full um, count of everyone. It's rely on the services um, reporting. Uh, and some people won't necessarily use NDIS registered providers. So that deals with people who are in the NDIS. Um, but then you have people who aren't in the NDIS or you have people who are in uh, state funded, uh, you know, group homes and so forth. Um, my understanding is the Victorian government is starting to get that information. I, I think it's very hard to know who's getting uh, who's who's uh, been infected in the community and certainly not in relation to people who aren't in uh, in the NDIS or in a group home setting. Um, so there is no routine data collected about people with disabilities. There's no routine data collected on the support, <coughs> um, which makes it very hard for us to know the extent of the problem. Right. I think you say in your statement at paragraph 94 that it is clear that the data system infrastructure was not, quote, fit for purpose for tracking infections among people with disability and their workers. And that remains your view? Yes, and I think that reflects um, um, something the Commission has probably um, dealt with all along, is the lack of good data collection and disability in any administrative data sets. Um, and uh, this makes it... You, you can't, you're in a situation there where you haven't got routine data collected. Um, you haven't got a commitment to collecting disability data in any data, data sets. People are trying to make up what to do um, in an emergency situation, which we shouldn't be having to do. It should be um, part of any any system. The third issue that you... Sorry, but again, I apologise for interrupting. Um, this may be obvious, but would you mind just explaining briefly why data is so important? I, it, without having information on who's being infected and uh, who's being infected who's, who have disabilities without knowing whether the workforce is being infected, we don't know the scale of the problem. We also don't know how it's being transmitted, um, which is terribly important in working out how do we intervene if we know, and, and if we know that there is a lot of uh, transmission happening between workers and people with disabilities, then we know something is going wrong in terms of risk of transmission. Um, if, uh, you know, if we know that people um, living in, in group homes or going to day programs or working in supported accommodate, sorry, working in supported employment environments are getting infected, we need to know that. We need to know what to do about those environments. Obviously, they're not safe places in terms of transmission risk. We, I, I can't underscore how important it is for us to understand what's happening. And I also think it's an accountability issue. Um, we need to know it's, it's an accountability issue to the public, to people with disabilities, and it's an accountability issue for government in terms of how well they are um, uh, protecting people with disabilities in this pandemic. I take it that uh, the people who tragically have passed away in aged care homes, many of those would uh, have had disabilities. Oh, a large proportion of those would have had disabilities, Thanks. a large proportion. The, the third issue that you raise is the response of the NDIA and the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. You identify this at paragraph 73 of your statement and elaborate on the issues at paragraph 101 to 125. There seems to be three particular issues of concern in relation to the response of these Commonwealth agencies. The first is the extent to which they had the assistance of a public health specialist and they looked at issues from a public health response. So I want you to comment on that. The second is directions to the service providers. And I think it's your view that none of the service providers could have been expected to have had a plan in place to deal with the type of pandemic and emergency that um, we have faced with COVID-19. But what assistance has been provided to the providers and in a sense a question that we've heard in the community a lot is who is in control 
And I, then the third third issue is the use of the NDIS funds and NDIS planning. And that is an issue which is certainly picked up in the statements of concern that I've drawn your attention to a little earlier. So can we deal with the first issue? The first concern that you identified is whether the Quality Safeguards Commission and or the agency had uh, or were equipped to deal with the issues from a public health perspective. What would you like to say about that? Um, I don't think anyone was equipped um, and they did need, a, it is a very specialised kind of response. Um, uh, this, as we've said, is a 100-year event. Um, we were perhaps thinking, if services were thinking about pandemic plans, they were thinking about influenza, not um, not uh, SARS-CoV-2, not the, what we're facing right at the moment. Um, so um, I don't think you can expect an agency or a commission that has no background in public health to be able to um, to rapidly uh, scale up their internal skill set to to be able to deal with the public health response. I don't. I, I can't comment because I don't know the agency or the commission the extent to which they they did bring in some of those um, skill sets. Um, but I, I think it remains a very important uh, recommendation of ours that they that they rapidly scale up their capacity in relation to a public health response and work closely with public health um, people in public health in in the Commonwealth and states right and, that, and in relation to the service providers you say in um, your view the approach of the quality and safeguards Commission could have been more directive about whether services and supports continued to be provided to individual service providers rather than the individual, sorry, rather than the individual service providers making that decision. And so you had a concern about the response for service providers might have created incentives for service providers, for example, to stay open or continue to provide services but that lack of direction for service providers to make a decision as to whether to continue or not. Can you just uh, assist us in terms of what those concerns were? So the Quality and Safeguard Commission did reach out to services um, and uh, provide them with information, but it was uh, incumbent on the services to make the decision as to whether they could continue to provide the service, and particularly in this context, I'm talking about day services and supported accommodation services, supported employment, sorry. Um, I'm not talking about group homes because obviously you need to continue to provide that service. Um, and also um, making sure, so to come back to your um, question, um, I do uh, believe that if you're thinking about a public health response, that uh, you do need directives. Uh, because essentially that's what we've done throughout uh, the pandemic. Um, everyone's been told how many people you can have in your in your house <laughs> and it's not up to you to decide whether or not you're going to let uh, more people into your house. Um, so I think there's um, there's we've done that across the board really and so we need to think about ways we could have done that better in the service disability service sector. Um, it's not easy. And it does, I'm not saying it's easy to close a day program or it's easy to close a supported accommodation service. I don't think it's easy because other people are, you know, people rely on those things. But I think there needed to be much more guidance and much more um, proactive uh, working with providers to think about alternative ways to provide supports. And, and like you said, the financial incentive was there, particularly as the response was to give providers 10% more to continue to provide a service. So um, it's very difficult then, uh, to, you know, you're financially dependent on, um, on providing that service to maintain your financial viability. And some, some services don't have the capacity to rapidly shift to a different way of providing that service. So they would, people would need to go to different service providers in those instances. You, you've said in paragraph 119 of your statement that in your view, the 10% loading created a perverse financial incentive for service providers to stay open 
You also recognise the additional costs of service provision during COVID-19, but you say there needed to be other ways to support services when they needed to cease activities or programs. So uh, do you want to say anything more in terms of what do you raise as a concern about the perverse financial incentive? No, I think I answered that before. I think there is a perverse financial incentive. I do think there needed to be some funding to services to be able to rapidly skill themselves up in the health public health response. And I don't think that needed to be linked to service provision. I think that was the problem, yeah. The fourth issue was the coordination uh, between different parts of the Commonwealth, but also between the Commonwealth and the state. So I think we've covered that in uh, the earlier questions. The fifth issue was workforce issues. And in early August, you were part of the research team that published a report, Disability Support Workers, The Forgotten Workforce of COVID-19. And commissioners, you have a copy of the report in the tender bundle part D behind tab uh, 107. And could, perhaps if we could just bring uh, that that up on the screen. There's some infographics in that report, which are the fact sheets. If you can have those pages. Sorry, we'll just get the numbers working here. So that's EXP 0031 0001.0086. All right, I think we could we can perhaps use what's on the screen. Um, there we go. Thank you. So there was a survey undertaken in relation to uh, people who are in the disability support worker industry, is that right? Yes. And the result of the survey came back with uh, a range of results and we've got them on the infographics, but can you just take us through what the key results were for this particular workforce? Okay, I, I think um, the key um, results for this workforce is that um, we that we found that at that point in time, this, so this was done in June, um, that um, there was still about a quarter of people who hadn't even done an onyal infection control training module for in the disability support workforce, and those that had. Um, uh, 50 percent nearly or nearly half of them actually wanted more training didn't feel like they were pr properly prepared um, so I think that um, so this is basic infection control training this is basic personal hygiene um, and um, and physical distancing and so forth so I think that to me pointed out the fact that we didn't have a confident workforce um, and also that the use of PPE at that time wasn't recommended. Um, uh, as we know, that's changed in Victoria now so that support workers are, are, are wearing uh, masks and so forth. Um, but at that time, some, there was quite a lot of um, uh, concern that people, uh, that support workers should be using some PPE and some services had actually um, uh, acquired those and people themselves had actually acquired them. Um, I think the other issue was um, the issue around um, support workers who um, were did decide that they didn't want to they didn't want to go to work because they um, had symptoms and right, so just sorry just pausing there we've got that graphic up so that's on page 0088 so two pages along. And in the top box is the results of the survey on testing for COVID-19. Yeah, so this about... Is quite, this is quite a concerning finding, isn't it? Um, so 23% were tested um, 
and 11% wanted to be tested. Um, some of the reasons they wanted to be tested were um, they, di they didn't actually have symptoms. They were concerned um, about their risk as a disability support worker um, and passing that on to um, the people they were supporting. Um, but others were, at, at the time they went for testing, um, dis disability support workers were not recognised as an essential workforce like healthcare and aged care workforces. So they weren't prioritised for testing at that point in time, which I think is um, pretty terrible um, and something we had been recommended, um, uh, recommending from the start. Um, and I think that actually was some mis a misunderstanding of the testers, but also a miscommunication from government regarding them being a priority uh, group for testing. Um, Can we so go back back a page um, on the infographics? <clears throat> so I want to ask you about the physical distancing yes. and also the infection control. So the survey found that 90% of workers were not able to maintain physical distancing in their day-to-day -day work and 53%, so this is just up the top there, uh, provided support with tasks that involve very close personal contact, such as feeding and brushing teeth. Yes. So the the consequence of these findings um, also prompted you to ask the question about the infection control and what PPE was provided to the support workers. So if we go further down that page... Uh, you've addressed the level of training for infection control. But yes. I just want to go to the next issue. So that's the results on infection control. And the next issue was the PPE. And so 64% of disability support workers had received or purchased some form of PPE. Yes. And then you, you, in terms of the PPE, the infographic set out where the equipment was provided by the employer or where the worker had provided. And so does this suggest that in some cases the employer was providing, but in other cases that the last line of worker provided, these are the workers themselves obtaining PPE? Yes, yes. yes. And um, some of them may have uh, bought it themselves and got some from their, their employers, um, but, yes, there were still um, a significant number of uh, workers purchasing gloves and masks in particular. Right. Now, this might seem very simplistic from my part, but um, why hasn't there been a national approach to ensuring that every disability support worker can be supplied or has been supplied with appropriate PPE? If you have a look at the demographics of the disability support workers, the majority are women and they seem to also be an older cohort themselves. You've identified in the infographics that 7% of workers are over the age of 60 and 31% are over the age of 50. Uh, why hasn't there been an immediate response to ensure that all disability support workers can have a guaranteed access to PPE? Not the not the time to freeze, but Perhaps we, could we just have a very short adjournment uh, just to ensure that we can organise for Professor Kavanagh to come back on? Yes, I'm almost complete. I've got about three questions to go, but I'd like to complete Dr. <coughs> uh, Professor Kavanagh's evidence. I think that would be highly desirable. So we will take a short break. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.
The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, Ms Eastman, we've uh, we managed to uh, recapture Professor Kavanagh. I can see um, Professor Kavanagh's moved location, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I, think we, I think I was asking you just about the workforce issue and um, about whether one might have ex expected by this stage of the pandemic and particularly given the situation in Melbourne whether and why all disability support workers haven't been provided with PPE. So I, I just want to point out the survey was done in June and we're actually um, about to go back and um, resurvey the workforce in the next week or so. So um, I imagine we'll get slightly different results at that point in time. Um, I think there were a number of issues early on, which was that there was actually not sufficient PPE um, in Australia. Um, and so the initial guidelines were um, did not include um, masks and so forth. I also think there was um, uh, there is now increasing evidence about the importance of masks in preventing transmission. Um, so ideally, I think it would have been better to have the workforce wearing masks from the start, um, but um, uh, that that wasn't the case, um, and I and I really um, welcome the new recommendations for greater PPE. But when we're talking about PPE, we're talking. Can I, if you don't mind me, just kind of going to this my my other concerns around PPE. Um, so you know, at a basic level, masks uh, need to be used, and we're all learning how to use masks. Um, and there's some people that, that won't be able to use masks um, who have disabilities. That's one side of it. But when we're talking about the workforce, what I'm incredibly concerned about um, is the, the, that they are in a COVID positive situation or someone's, someone's either got COVID, COVID or they're suspected to have COVID and they have to use full PPE, which means, you know, gowns, goggles, masks, um, gloves, and um, that's actually a highly technical skill. And we've seen in the healthcare workforce, cross-contamination in the healthcare workforce all across the world. And we're talking about support workers needing to suddenly learn how to use full PPE. The risk of cross-contamination is high. And um, you can't learn that off a video. There's just no way, I believe, that you can learn how to use adequate PPE, full PPE off a video. You need training and um, in the case where there's a COVID positive environment you need health staff working alongside the support workforce to enable the support workforce to stay safe and for people with disabilities to stay safe. So um, I, I, um, I think there is a real need uh, to think about that and I, I don't believe you can leave it on services to make sure that their support workforce is trained to do this. The, the, I think the sixth issue was NDIA, and I think we've covered that again in the course of the uh, discussion this morning. Can, can I ask you this? Looking at the situation at the present time, so we're now mid-August, what are the immediate uh, needs in the sense that the Commonwealth in particular needs to address and to the extent that there are issues touching on a state response, uh, what are those immediate needs? Okay, so one immediate need is to have a workforce. <laughs> um, services um, could lose a, la a large proportion of their workforce quite quickly if, if there was um, particularly smaller services and aren't in a position to upscale. So we need to make sure we have that surge workforce. So and can I ask you that, just pausing it, in terms of having a surge workforce, um, I, I think we've heard about surge workforces in the context of aged care, but he's yes. talking about a, a workforce that is a surge workforce specific for disability or a surge yeah. workforce that is a health response? Both. <laughs> Um, uh, so I think we need a surge workforce that's a health response. So we need to make sure um, uh, that we have a healthcare workforce that can work with the disability support workforce. Um, and we need to be able to rapidly deploy that within an hour. 
you know, like it can't take two days to get that workforce mobilised. Who, who should have responsibility for that? Should that be localised at a state or local government level or uh, reflecting back on the question the Chair asked you earlier, is this uh, an area where you expect the Commonwealth to take the lead or have the primary responsibility? Um, I think it's. A, I think you would expect the state to be able to identify their workforce, but with the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth needs to take leadership across the states on what an ideal disability emergency response would look like. I think, um, and then work with the states. Um, now we've learnt from Victoria, we've had to do that pretty quickly, um, and so now each state around Australia needs to be doing that and I think that's something that we should be working on in a Commonwealth level as to what that would look like, how would that look like in terms of best practice So um, and uh, resourcing the states to do that in collaboration with the relevant Commonwealth agencies. Um, the other issue I think that's incredibly important um, and which we've seen in aged care is um, uh, restricting people's workers' movements between settings. So at the moment, uh, and in our survey, um, you might note that a number of people were working across multiple settings. Um, and uh, in, in the um, pandemic, in fact, some workers told us that, you know, like I said, some services closed, say, day programs. So they actually started working across multiple, multiple group homes because there was a, the residents were home more. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a real issue. And some of them work for multiple service providers um, and some work in aged care. So uh, we have a perfect storm there and we really need to think through how we can do uh, minimise movement of workers um, so they're only providing support for a, a, a specified number of people. And um, that requires much greater collaboration across the sector because some... Uh, services are smaller and, and don't have the capacity to do that. Support workers may end up losing income, which we have already seen in the pandemic, and we need to make sure that they don't suffer financially because of that. But I think it's um, really critical when community transmission is high that we think through how we reduce the mobility of that workforce. Uh so I jumped in and asked you some questions about the responsibility for such a workforce. I think we're, we were dealing with the immediate needs and actions. Is there anything else in addition to workforce issues? Oh, can I mention one more thing around the workforce? Um, I think we need to guarantee pay pandemic leave uh, for that workforce. It's an absolute must. <laughs> um, and so they don't come to work sick. Sorry, your other question was uh, sorry. just on on the areas of immediate need. So, given um, the the issues you've raised over the the course yep. of the pandemic, stemming back to mid March, um, and I think you've said in your evidence many of the concerns that you've raised have been acted on. Government has responded to them. I suppose I'm trying to do a marker now at this oh, point oh in time in mid August. What uh, what is either remaining? Or what are the immediate needs because of the changed circumstances? Can I put it another way that supplements what Ms Eastman has asked? What would you like us to do? What I would like you to do, I would yep. like you to recommend that there is um, a rapid um, scaling up of each state's capacity to respond to COVID positive situations, a rapid um, scaling up of the workforce, more support for the disability services, um, not leaving uh, the onus on them to ensure that they're, that they're providing safe services, um, more direction on um, when it's safe to provide particular types of services and what they should do, greater outreach into the services themselves and to the workers. People aren't talking to the workers. This is all conversation happening at a higher level. People aren't talking to people with disabilities. That conversation needs to start to happen so we come up with on-the-ground solutions. Um, I feel very strongly that, um, that there's a lack of understanding in the health sector about the dis what happens in the disability sector and there's probably a lack of understanding in disability about what a public health response is. And um, so I would um, 
really urge uh, you to reach out to make sure that services can continue to be provided but are done safely so that they protect people with disabilities um, and the workforce. And there are a range of ways that that can be done, but there needs to be leadership and there must be emergency response that can be rapidly scaled up. And we saw um, here in Victoria when we first sound out, saw outbreaks in group homes that we were not ready to scale up that response. Um, so there's a lot to learn from Victoria and we should learn it. Uh, I think just given the time, those are the questions that, that I wanted to ask you. The commissioners may have some questions and then commissioners, I'll come back to you on the planning for the rest of the morning. Thank you, Ms Eastman. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Bennett first. Um, it's um, thank you, um, Professor Kavner, for your um, uh, appearing today. The issue that I'm trying to um, understand or the feasibility of it yeah. goes to your proposition that you would have um, nursing staff working with support workers when the health system itself was, you know, trying to recall nurses, there was a shortage. Um, I note that you also say there's sort of different models where there's train the trainer. So the real outcome is that there's proper training. It doesn't necessarily have to be delivered by medical staff if there is pressure on having enough medical staff in our health system. Is that is that right? Well, I think um, I don't know that the nursing staff would need to be there the whole time. I think they could be there early in the response to make sure everything's going well. Um, I do think there are train the trainer models that could be used. Um, I think we have, it is difficult. Um, uh, the, the other possibility is using latter year nursing students, for instance, but also bringing in a workforce from interstate, which we have seen happen in some situations. Commissioner Galbally. Um, thank you very much for your um, evidence. Um, are, there, are there other countries where they've done this better um, and actually brought health and, dis and disability support workers together? Uh, not that I know of, um, unfortunately. I mean, I actually know of the appalling situation in the UK. So I could tell you um, how bad that has been. Um, uh, so, but I, I, I'm not aware, because uh, I work with colleagues in the UK, I'm not aware with where there has been um, um, good responses. Uh, you've made me think, though, I'm going to look for it. Thank you. I also want to thank you, Professor Kavanagh. You've covered an enormous number of areas in your statement and in your evidence. Uh, when Ms Eastman asked you about uh, urgent steps, immediate steps to be taken, um, you didn't mention the compilation of data. Uh, okay. I take it that will be one of the areas that you would like to see action taken as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, absolutely, ASAP. <laughs> And who would do that? Well, I, I think that's the question, isn't it? I think it needs to be collected um, at the time when we're collecting information about the infections um, because, again, like I said before, the NDIS um, is, only has some people um, and some participants um, and they don't... Uh, the Quality and Safeguard Commission doesn't have um, uh, oversight of um, uh, non-NDIS registered providers. There, you know, there's there's a whole lot of situations where you're going to get an incomplete uh, picture with just using Quality and Safeguard Commission data. That's important, but it's only some of it. So we need it collected at the coal face in terms of um, when we're recording infections. We need to know whether the person has a disability, and we need to know if someone is a disability support worker as well. <clears throat> yes, thank you for that. Um, can I? You may not have seen this. I'm not sure, but there was a media release from the minister for the NDIS yesterday, which announced that the Commonwealth will commence providing data on infection rates of COVID-19 for NDIS participants and workers. Have you, have you seen that media release? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I, I missed that media release. <laughs> The, the media release indicates that uh, cumulatively since March 2020, uh, there have been uh, nationally 86 participants, 145 workers who have been uh, positive COVID-19. 
but I just want to understand the significance of this material. I take it this is material that's been collected uh, since March, but just hasn't been published. So it's now being published. Yes, obviously, it's now being published. Um, yes. And the figures for the reasons you've given are very likely to be incomplete. I would say that, yeah, I think they're an, under an undercount. And when we talk about people uh, on NDIS, we're talking about people under the age of 65. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, all right. Thank and we're talking me. about 10% of people with disabilities. Well, I think we saw the figures, uh, 360 odd thousand people are on the NDIS, people with disability, 4.4 million people with disability in Australia, 2.4 million people under the age of 65 with disability. Yeah. yeah um Yes, exactly. So we are missing out on uh, a lot of people there. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kavanagh, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for the statement that you have prepared, the evidence that you have given. Uh, it is uh, enormously helpful. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioners, uh, uh I finally got to that point where our timetable is a little out of the shape that I wanted it to be in. So I apologise to our two witnesses who were waiting to give their evidence before 11. If it's convenient to have the morning tea adjournment now till quarter past or just after quarter past 11, and we'll resume with Dr Meltzer from Sydney. And at that point, I'll hand over to Brisbane and my apologies to our colleagues in Brisbane for this morning's sort of arrangements. Uh, but I think we'll still be able to get through all of the evidence today. But there may be a few smaller breaks during the course of the morning to just accommodate the witnesses as they're coming through. We'll resume then at 11.15. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Ms Eastman. We'll adjourn until then. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.
The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, Ms Eastman. Um, Commissioners, there is also a statement provided to the Royal Commission from Professor Julian Troller. You'll find a copy of Professor Troller's statement in t Part B of the tender bundle behind Tab 34. And there are some annexes to the statement. They are to be found in Tab D, sorry, Part D, Tabs 123 to 125. Uh, could I ask you to mark Professor Troller's statement as Exhibit 5.36 and the annexes 5.36.1 to 5.36.3? I, I don't propose to deal with Dr Troller's evidence in any detail, but uh, I'll just draw Commissioner's your attention to paragraph 20 of his statement where he says, in my opinion, this situation, and he's talking there to the advisory service calls and a knowledge bank, uh, highlights a current lack of ability to rapidly collate, catalogue and approve information for distribution to relevant parties for their use across all jurisdiction, jurisdictions. This approach requires the ability to work locally at a state and territory level and national jurisdictions to ensure that resources are available, readily shared and not duplicated. So Professor Troller has indicated a number of concerns of a similar nature to those identified by Professor Kavanagh. So if you're, if Commissioners, you take that evidence into account. Thank you. Can I move then to our next witness? And my apologies to Dr. Ariella Meltzer, who I know has been waiting to, to come on for a period of time, and she's our next witness. You'll find a copy of her statement in Tender Bundle Part B behind Tab 24, and she has a number of annexes one uh, at tab 25 and then in part D of the bundle at tabs 111 to 122. And I'll ask you to mark uh, the material as exhibit 5.31 and then 5.31.1. Could I just perhaps just ask the Brisbane Hearing Room to go on mute? Could I ask the Brisbane Hearing Room to go on mute? So it'll be marked 5.3.1.2 and 5.3.1.13. Thank you. I'm sorry, Dr Meltzer, you're with us. Thank you for joining us. Dr Meltzer, I also am sorry for keeping you waiting, but uh, I'll ask my associate to administer the oath or affirmation, please. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, Dr Meltzer. Ms Eastman will now ask you some questions. So you are Dr Ariella Meltzer? Yes. And you're a research fellow with the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales? That is correct. You've prepared a statement dated 7 August. Are the contents of that statement true? They are. Can I start with a little bit about your professional background? As you've said, you're a research fellow at the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales. And the research centre is a national research and education centre dedicated to catalyzing social change for a better world. And you have been a member of the centre since June 2015, is that right? Yes. And you've done uh, other work as part of the University of New South Wales in a research capacity since May 2010? Correct, yes. Your research focuses on research with disadvantaged groups, gathering lived experience information to contribute to research and evaluation to improve the functioning of social purpose sector and address complex social problems. Yes. 
the the nature of your research methodology is what? And you've, I know you've set this out in the statement, but can you help the Royal Commission about the uh, approach that you take to research given the particular focus that you have? Absolutely. So I do mainly qualitative research, uh, which is based on talking with people and gathering information based on what they say. Um, in particular, in my disability research, I focus on using accessible research methods to ensure that as many people as possible are able to contribute to the research process in a way that is meaningful to them. Um, in most of my research, this means using uh, easy questions uh, that are straightforward for people to understand and answer in their own language. The um, level or pitch of the language will vary depending on who I'm speaking to. And sometimes I'll also use other accessibility tools in the research process, such as the pictures that you might see in easy uh, read information. Um, and I've also done some research, for example, that has used Auslan interpreters uh, in interviews. Now, the Royal Commission has heard over the course of this hearing the importance of information and the importance of information being in an accessible and appropriate form. So it's easy to say there should be accessible information, but in your statement, you explain to the Royal Commission what is accessible information. Can I ask you to address those matters and commissioners, you'll find these matters set out at paragraph 10 through to paragraph 14 of the statement. Absolutely. So in a really plain English definition rather than the technical definition, Accessible information refers to information that can be used and understood by people with disability because it appropriately accommodates their support needs. Uh, there are different types of accessibility that information might conform to. So some examples are that visual accessibility or print accessibility are where documents are made in a way that's accessible to people with low vision. For example, it may use large text, wide spacing or sans serif fonts. Um, another type of accessibility is web accessibility, which refers to information being made technologically in such a way um, that it accommodates people's support needs. A really well-known example of this is that um, images have alternate text behind them so that screen readers can read out a description of a picture. Um, that's not the only component of web accessibility, but it's one good example. Uh, web accessibility is, is Sorry, web governed by an international code. Um, conceptual accessibility is another form. Uh, this means that information uses easy language and only the main points of information, so it's easy to understand. Common formats in Australia are easy read and easy English. And another really important example of information accessibility at, la at large is uh, translating information into Auslan. And the approach that you take in your work is also informed by the fact that information accessibility is a human right and you've referred to Article 21 of the United Nations Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities about the nature of the right to information and communications being provided on an equal basis. So that also informs the approach that you take in your research, is that right? Yeah, it means that fundamentally information being accessible is something that needs to happen uh, in research and in society at large and as we'll discuss today in situations such as COVID. All right, well, let's get to COVID-19. So what you have uh, undertaken some research with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, you've identified that one of the significant issues for people with disability was accessibility to key health information and information that may impact upon people's day-to-day -day lives. And you've said in your statement that having access to good quality and up-to-date information in accessible formats might be quite literally a matter of life and death. So knowing what to do, where to go for help, what the safety rules are, 
and people with disability being in serious or imminent danger, that there needs to be accessible information. Yes. So the approach that you took to your research was in the early days of the crisis, you started to compile a list of information on the virus that claimed to be accessible for people with disability. And can you tell us that the work that you did between March and late May, what was the results of the exercise of compiling a list and what did you find? Absolutely. Uh, so I compiled that list between March and late May uh, 2020. Um, I didn't use a systematic approach for that search, so there are some limitations to it from a research perspective. Um, however, the approach that I used was observing what accessible information came up in my social media feeds, um, and in many ways that simulated the experience of a person with disability and how they might locate accessible information in their everyday life. The end result of the list by late May was that there was between 90 and slightly over 100 accessible resources on the list, depending on the way that they're counted, um, which is, um, there were various ways that, that they were documented. Um, and there was quite a variety of information on that list across various formats as well, which I can talk about if you would like a bit later. You You've provided a copy of the list as part of your statement, but I won't take you through all of the list. But what about the nature of the information? What came out of your research in terms of the 90 or possibly over 100 accessible resources? What were the features that you observed about the nature of those resources and the degree to which they were accessible? Sure. Um, there were... A number of issues that came out of the list in terms of my observations of it, in terms of what it actually meant for the information to be accessible. Um, so making information accessible is not simply about providing a resource, but actually thinking about issues such as the timing of when it comes out, um, how it's disseminated, who makes it, um, and issues about the coverage of the information and the, and the updates as well. I guess the underlying point is that in a, in a fast-moving crisis such as COVID, you really need to be thinking about all of those aspects to make your accessibility work well. One, one of the re reflections that you had on undertaking this research was about what does accessible information need in terms of mitigating against the risk of the information not being properly thought out, not being properly designed and planned, and becoming possibly tokenistic and not actually addressing the information that the reader, the viewer, or the recipient might actually need. So you've reflected on that, and those reflections are addressed in your statement by identifying a few particular issues. So can I take you to those matters? Yes. So the first one was the issue of how quickly does accessible information come out? So how quickly is the information available? And you, you observe that you started to see disability advocacy organisations putting information into easy read or other accessible formats. And you referred in paragraph 24 to your statement to the growing space and also some resources from the New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability and other groups. And you say this was very useful and reassuring to see. They're the disability groups. What about from government and government agencies? Was there anything that you saw about the speed in which accessible information was coming from government? Sure. Um, so when I first started keeping the list in mid-March, most of the resources that were coming out were from the types of groups that you've just mentioned, disability advocacy agencies or specialist information access services. In terms of the resources that came out from government in that early period in mid-March, um, the NDIS put out some early information about the implications of COVID-19 for its participants, for the way its services would function and for its support workers. Um, but beyond the NDIS information, um, the other government-branded 
easy information only came out uh, two weeks later at the end of March. That was from the Department of Social Services. Um, while a two-week lag in normal circumstances might not have much of an impact, in a fast-moving crisis, um, two weeks is a long time. Particularly in mid-March, we didn't know how serious COVID would be in Australia. We didn't know how fast it would escalate. And people with disability who, as the Commission has heard, you know, really had some serious concerns about COVID, um, particularly at that time, really needed that information earlier than it came out. Um, the government, the Australian government was criticised in the media at the time for not having a timely public health campaign on COVID-19 in general, but more standard format information came out earlier than the accessible information did. So can I jump to another topic that you've identified, which is the extent to which accessible information is kept up to date? So sure. the Royal Commission has heard evidence that that during the pandemic, things are very fast moving, situations may change, a situation such as Victoria going into a hard lockdown, that information is required quickly and it's kept up to date. One of the risks that you've identified is that the information in an accessible format might not be kept up to date to address changes as they're occurring. And um, what were the particular concerns that you identified in your research with respect to information being kept up to date? Sure. Um, where accessible resources have been made in the past, pre-COVID, um, I think quite often what has happened is that one accessible resource uh, has been made and then that is often what's there if not for perpetuity, then certainly for a long time on that particular issue. Um, that approach in a crisis such as COVID um, is not appropriate because the information continues to change, it continues to develop, the rules continue to change, the dangers to people continue to change as well. Um, and so there was really an imperative for the accessible information that was produced to come out much quicker and at a much faster pace than probably had ever happened for many um, people producing accessible information ever before. What I noticed in keeping my list was that only some of the groups who produced accessible information on COVID-19 really updated their offerings or continued to constantly update their offerings um, during the time that I was keeping my list. Um, notably, the groups that did um, continually update their offerings are the ones that I would consider to be the very high quality providers of accessible information, um, in part precisely for that reason. Uh, the other thing I would note was that more progressive updates came from the Specialist Information Access Services and Disability Advocacy Organisations than came from government in the Department of Social Services uh, resources. Those were updated. Um, there were mm -hmm. updates from government. Um, but they certainly didn't happen at the same pace as some of the other organisations, um, particularly when there are a lot of new social distancing rules um, being announced very progressively, sometimes on a weekly basis. Um, it was some of the specialist providers such as Access Easy English who was providing the updated information after each round of, of new rules came out um, rather than that specific information um, being provided in the government resources. The final question I wanted to ask you, and you've covered this in some detail in the statement, is the importance about the who takes responsibility for the accuracy of information. So while some of the information might be uh, information about rules coming from governments, who ensures that the information, if it's uh, information provided through advocacy groups or other sources, who checks the accuracy and who is responsible ultimately for the accuracy of accessible information? And in paragraph 55 and 56 of your statement, you've made some comments about 
how, how accuracy can be maintained, but at the same time ensuring a broad reach of accessible information. Can I ask you to comment on that? That's my last question, and the commissioners might have a few questions as well. Sure. I think the issue of accuracy of information is very important. Um, the, the, the issue around the accuracy of the information um, kind of pertains to two areas. So on the one hand, you want high quality information that's accurate from a technical perspective of what makes it accessible. And on the other hand, you want accurate information from the perspective of the medical and social or legal information included um, about COVID-19 um, and the legal requirements around it. And so there's two very different areas of expertise in there um, to constitute what will make <coughs> information. I think the reality um, is that some collaboration is required uh, to make information accessible and accurate. Um, I think there needs to be collaboration between organisations who are making the accessible information, um, who are specialist providers of accessible information and know how to do it well. I think there needs to be collaboration with health and legal experts who can check the accuracy of the medical and legal information included. There also needs to be collaboration with people with disability who will use the information, who should also be involved in making it, including from a design perspective as well as um, checking the quality of the information as well. Um, how to do that in a practical sense when there are timeliness issues, particularly in COVID, um, is a really difficult question. Um, collaboration takes time uh, and quality checking takes time as well. Um, and so how to balance those issues of how to make things accurate and high quality and also be timely is a challenge. Um, there has been so far some collaboration uh, where um, the information ideas has been asked by government to run the Disability Information Helpline, which has a specific remit of um, distributing COVID information. Uh, and I think that that is a very useful model. Um, I think in terms of ensuring this idea of accurate, high quality information, um, there's probably the opportunity to further fund and resource that work. And there's probably an opportunity to have a quality check system um, so that information can be checked um, and marked as high quality where it meets um, certain criteria. Um, I think it's also important, though, that the information continues to be disseminated by the original provider, potentially before um, it has the quality check so that it meets that timeliness component. But when there is um, a notification that it has not passed a quality check um, approval, uh, then that can be noted so that people can know where to find that information. And maybe it's distributed by a central provider, such as the Disability Information Helpline. I think what would need to constitute the remit or the characteristics of a quality check system is something that probably requires further research and evidence to know what to include there. Uh, an obvious contender would be that providers of accessible information need to be appropriately skilled and have undertaken training to do it, and probably that it needs to be core business for their organisation. However, beyond that, I think that there is a lot of scope for consultation and engagement with both the relevant information providers and people with disability who will use the information to know what constitutes that, that high quality. I think a structure for enabling collaboration between those people to make it high quality is also important. So a structure for collaboration between information producers, medical specialists and people with disabilities is, is also important and maybe separate to the quality check approach. Thank you, Dr Meltzer. Commissioners? Um, um, thank you, Dr Meltzer. Did you um, examine um, 
accessible information that would go to uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities um, or First Nations people? And did you have any observations, if you did, any specific observations about that material? I did not specifically examine that information. Um, I focused my list uh, predominantly on or well, exclusively on information that was appropriate and made accessible for people with disability. There is some overlap, however. So, for example, some of the Easy Read and Easy English documents are used by people from non-English speaking backgrounds as well or who have um, low English literacy for other reasons other than disability. Um, so there's there's some overlap, but it wasn't something that I examined specifically. Commissioner Galbally. Um, the, thank you very much um, for that very important um, presentation. Um, I'm thinking about your uh, paragraph 55 and your discussion about people with disabilities being part of the making of the accessible information. Um, would that also include them identifying what information they wanted? as well as being part of the actual production of the information so that it's tailored to what they're likely to use? Absolutely. So I think where people with disability are involved in a design process for information that really needs to be from the beginning. It needs to be from saying what's needed, what form it, needed, it needs to take, um, what will make it accessible for them. Um, and then involved in some of the logistics around making the information um, and, and checking that it does meet the quality criteria. And I think that including people with disability right from the outset and having them drive that process is going to be really critical to making sure that people with disability get the information that they need. And would you say that that should be for government too, to build it into their production of information for, that's supposed to be accessible? Yes. I think where information is made to be accessible, it needs to include people with disability in the production process right from the beginning, no matter who's making the information, certainly government and others, um, because the the process will be richer and more accurate with their feedback um, and their capacity to drive what happens in a way that's going to be useful for them. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr Meltzer, thank you very much, both for your work, your research work, the statement uh, that you have provided and for your evidence today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I'll now hand over to Dr Melafont in Brisbane. Thank you and good morning. The next witness is Dr Dinesh Palapana. Dr Palapana's statement is at Tender Bundle A, tab 30. I ask it be marked Exhibit 5.13. The associated documents are at Tender Bundle A, tabs 31 through 34. And I ask they be marked Exhibit 5.13.1 through to 5.13.4. Yes, thank you. Dr. Palapana joins me here in the Brisbane room, having travelled from the Gold Coast this morning. May I ask that the affirmation be administered? I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank Can you, you state your full name? Sorry. Sorry, Dr. Melafont will now ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. My apologies. Can you state your full name, please? Yes, it's Dinesh Bandara Palapano. And you've made an 11 page statement dated the 4th of August 2020. Yes, Senior Counsel. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. And you are obviously a doctor? Yes. And you are currently working as a senior house officer in the emergency department of the Gold Coast Hospital and Health Service. I am. 
You're also a lecturer at Griffith University and a researcher at Menzies Health Institute of Queensland. I am. And in your spare time, you somehow managed to do a Bachelor of Laws from QUT and completed a graduate diploma of legal practice. Is that yes. correct? Yes, I have. And you're busy preparing admission documents. I am senior counsel. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> You've also completed an advanced clerkship in radiology at, at Harvard. Is that correct? Yes, I have. And amongst other things, you are an ambassador for Physical Disability Australia, a member of the Inclusive Workplace Committee Treasury, a member of the ambassador at the Hopkins Centre, and a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the Perry Cross Spinal Research Foundation. I am. Okay. And you're here, though, today expressing your own views, not on behalf of your employer or any other organisation. That's correct, Senior okay. Counsel. Now, you have a spinal cord injury. I do. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, I suffered a spinal cord injury in 2010 as a result of a single motor vehicle accident. Uh, as a result of the injury, I have lost the use of all sensory and motor functions below the chest, as well as the use of my fingers and parts of my arms. And you use, obviously, a wheelchair for mobility. Yes, I use a wheelchair for my mobility. Okay. Now, from your medical training, you are aware of intrinsic physiological vulnerabilities that can increase the risk of complications and death from COVID-19? Yes, Senior Counsel, and I can speak to them from my own situation as an example. As a part of the spinal cord injury, it was high enough that my respiratory muscles were also paralyzed. Normally, a person uses the muscles in their chest to cough and breathe, for example. In my situation, all these muscles are paralyzed, and I use a diaphragm only in my body to breathe. And as a result, my respiratory function is significantly compromised. When the accident initially happened, I couldn't talk a full sentence like this to you and was dependent on supplemental oxygen for a long period of time. There are other people in our community who are dependent on a ventilator 24 hours a day um, and have other respiratory compromises as a result of their disabilities as well. And this means that I and others like me have to be particularly cautious. Now, are you aware of instances where some people with disability delayed presentations to hospital due to being scared of contracting COVID-19? Yes, absolutely. The general community was afraid to present to hospitals during COVID-19 because they were scared of contracting COVID-19. In fact, our emergency department experienced quite a significantly reduced number of presentations at the height of the pandemic early on. I can speak about one particular friend who uh, had a very complicated course through uh, COVID-19 because of a complication related to their disability. This was very complicated due to some social situation uh, problems that they had as well. Uh, this person had a very difficult set of circle, social circumstances. They lived alone and some of the care agencies that were attending to him uh, were also taking advantage of him before and during the pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, they became isolated from the community. Um, their access to caregivers was also reduced and they were afraid to present to a hospital to a mounting complication that they had. When they did present to the hospital, it was very late in the course of their problem and they ended up requiring intensive care for a period of time, and they were in a very precarious situation as a result. It's arguable that if they presented to a hospital earlier, and if they had more comprehensive care in the community, that this could have been avoided, and their life may not have been put at risk. Can you tell us of your experience of working in a hospital at the start of the pandemic? You've already mentioned the reduction in numbers, but you speak about the impact you observed on staff. Yeah. 
senior counsel, we often work in a stressful environment. Hospitals are a stressful place. Emergency departments are a stressful place to work at a baseline. And my colleagues do an amazing job every single day. But they see the toughest things in life. They see assault. They see death. They see suffering every single day. So the level of stress put on people is very high. COVID-19 increased that level of stress. And we saw a significantly elevated level of anxiety. We saw elevated levels of stress and even conflict. Um, apart from patients that were presenting late due to complications from even things like appendicitis, um, who required protracted courses of screening for COVID-19, even things like managing PPE, which was previously a very easy thing to access, became tightly managed. But all these things uh, raised the level of stress enough where some of my colleagues around the world sadly had some tragic consequences and we saw an increased level of suicides. One of the most publicized one was an emergency physician in New York who committed suicide during COVID-19. And this has also been the case in our country as well, unfortunately. So the levels of stress and uh, difficulties that people are undergoing were significant. Some of my colleagues were isolated from their families. They had kids, they had babies, they had elderly parents who they had to isolate themselves from. So all these things made life more stressful than it already was. I want to move to the topic of healthcare rationing, which you've referred to in your statement. What is this? Healthcare rationing is allocating a limited amount of resources to patients that require them. A very prominent example during the pandemic in, that came up in some countries is allocating a limited amount of ICU beds to more patients than there were beds. So far in Australia, we, we've been lucky. And we haven't had this situation happen, but we have certainly seen it in places like Italy and more recently Texas. In, uh, in Europe, are there guidelines for critical care in adults? Yes, Senior Counsel. The, uh, guideline, one guideline I can refer you to is from the National Institute of Healthcare Excellence, or NICE. And uh, I must say that the guidelines that they developed for COVID-19 are not so nice in that they, if you look at the algorithm explicitly, they allowed the discrimination of people with stable long-term disabilities like cerebral palsy and even autism and intellectual difficulties. These guidelines called on decision makers to consider how frail a person is and if they were considered to be too frail based on any of these disabilities, they, the guidelines suggest that you defer critical care for these patients. And after you defer critical care, if they suffered significant deterioration in their condition, to refer them to end-of-life care, whereas an able-bodied person or an otherwise healthy person would not be referred to end-of-life care. And you're speaking there about the COVID-19 rapid guideline of Title. I am Senior Counsel. Has the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Society adopted the same approach? No. Um, we've also got in Australia some decision-making tools uh, for complex decision-making during the pandemic. And these guidelines call for all respect <clears throat> among all patients. And it asks practitioners to ignore unnecessary uh, considerations such as race, gender, sexual orientation, and disability. These guidelines also recommend prioritizing people that experience social inequities in society um, and when allocating resources to consider, um, consider redressing those vulnerabilities. And so those guidelines are the guiding principles for complex decision-making during pandemic COVID-19? Yes, Senior Counsel. 
uh, I, I must add, though, even though these guidelines build some protection, um, we still need to be vigilant. So, Dr. even though they I'm do sorry, Dr. Melifont, I wonder if I just might ask a question there. Um, you've referred both to the NICE guidelines and ANZICs. Which one is actually authoritative, or are they both authoritative? Which one takes precedence? For Australia, Commissioner, we would go by the ANZICs guidelines. When you say we, you mean intensive care medical practice? Yes, and sorry, we mean we mean in the country. Um, I I am not an intensive care physician, but intensive care physicians would. Thank you. Whereas the NICE guidelines have applicability in Europe. Yes. Predominantly. Okay. All right. So you speak about our guidelines here building in some protections, but do you still hold concerns that bias, whether unconscious or conscious, might come into clinical decision making in respect of treating people with disability in this pandemic? I do. And... I have spoken to intensive care physicians who say that, who are amazing people, and they say that they would do everything to make sure that people are treated with respect and equity. I have also, though, spoken to, spoken to people who are decision makers that are close friends and colleagues of mine who say that we need to give intensive care resources to patients who have the best chance of surviving. If you take me, uh, a 35-year-old with a high-level spinal cord injury and a 35-year-old without, and there's one intensive care bed, I can argue that I would have a poor chance of survival compared to the other person. We often hear in medicine, for example, when uh, we care for the elderly, uh, I am sometimes, I, I've sometimes heard the conversation is this person a good eight-year-old or a crumbly eight-year-old? And the answer to this question can sometimes guide the clinical decision-making and what care they get. In a similar vein, uh, there's literature that suggests that people with disability experience unfounded judgments about their quality of life and thus the care that they get. Um, I think particularly when a patient's ability to express their wants and needs and their intellectual capacity is limited, I, f I worry about the risk that they're put at. I've more than once provided care for uh, people with disabilities in my capacity as an emergency doctor who've experienced suboptimal care in the community by their caregivers. I've seen neglect and I've seen people come in with significant complications as a result of that neglect. And I think COVID-19 exacerbates all these risks for people. I've also seen this happen to people that I know. Do you have a particular example in that respect? Um, I mean, the, the example that I gave earlier about uh, my friend suffering neglect is one. Um, I've... I have seen, I have had caregivers in the past that also care for other people. And um, one particular day, I spoke to a caregiver who had dropped a person in their home. And uh, when you don't have sensation below in your legs or elsewhere, you could easily fracture something and get into serious trouble. And this person was laughing about dropping that person. Um, I, I've, I've seen this happen all the time, and I've seen people come into the ED as a result of neglect. Um, another story that, I, that I've come across recently was uh, people, there, there are people that are dependent on 24-hour care or, or people that are dependent on care to go about their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I am one of them. I, re I require uh, help from people every day to get dressed, shower, go about my activities of daily living and get to work. Um, and a lot of people are dependent on transactional care um, by care providers. Now, if these, I, I came across a story recently where people um, were, 
a certain person was affected by some respiratory symptoms. Um, and these days, when, whenever we have these symptoms, even a cold, people get a bit worried. And, um, you know, sometimes they require testing as well. And their care agency uh, stopped sending caregivers. So how do these people survive then when they're dependent on care to even just get out of bed? Uh, they end up being neglected. So um, the, these, are, these are the situations that people can find themselves in. And I think even for me, that's a risk. We have to even think about testing. Uh, when someone develops upper respiratory tract symptoms or fevers or anything like that, it is recommended that they test themselves for COVID-19. And it's actually one of the strengths of our country is that we test so vigorously. But after being tested, you're supposed to isolate for a period of time until you get your result. So what do I do when I present for testing and I need help from someone to get to the testing center? I need help from someone to get home. And then what do I do when I get home until the result comes? I've actually been tested twice so far, and uh, I've been lucky enough to get the result fairly quickly where I could just sit in a corner by myself. Um, but if there are protracted test results, I think people can run into some serious difficulties. And all of these things, as I understand your evidence, speak to the very clear need to ensure uh, sufficient education of carers and medical staff to protect against any kind of conscious or unconscious bias in the care or medicine they, they give or administer? Absolutely. I think the most fundamental risk that people face if things deteriorate is facing bias, and I have seen it, um, and it's well documented in the literature as well. And apart from the bias, it's understanding the difficulties that people with disabilities face and having the knowledge to navigate that. I want to move now to page six of the notes. Um, so in the event that we are stretched to a resource-limited environment, what's your hope? I hope that, A, people with disabilities are treated equitably and have a good chance of accessing resources, and, B, that... Healthcare providers and healthcare institutions have the knowledge and resources in place to accommodate people sufficiently. Can I ask you uh, this question? For some people, they have potentially acute consequences if they go without care for even one day. Yeah. Yourself yes. is an example. Can you give us, for you, if you went without yeah. care for one day, what might be an acute consequence? Absolutely. Um, for example, uh, I, I have, uh, I'm dependent on a catheter for urinary function. If that catheter gets blocked, I can develop a complication called autonomic dysreflexia, and that's a life-threatening complication if it goes unintended. Before the pandemic, healthcare providers were had a uh, poor level of education on this complication as it were. Some of the literature suggests that somewhere, you know, even up to 48 to 90 percent of healthcare providers were not well versed enough on how to manage this complication. So if I was left at home, apart from basic needs like food, water, showering, if a catheter blockage happens or something else happens, I could potentially develop this complication and I know people who have died from it because until you resolve it quickly, it just escalates and you can suffer a heart attack or a hemorrhage in the brain. Again, pointing to the need to ensure that support workers are available. Absolutely. Right. Support workers need to be available and support needers, workers need to be educated. Okay. So, I want to um, ask you now whether you're concerned that strict infection control measures demanded by COVID may mean that some people with disability might not have access to equipment that they need within the hospital environment. Yes, I think the uh, 
when you when you go into a hospital, that patients can be put in isolation, and um, I'm dependent on my wheelchair, for example. So uh, some people are dependent on communication devices like um, iPads or communication boards that they might carry around. Some people are dependent on walking sticks, hearing aids. We need to make sure that when a person presents to a hospital that these bits of equipment are kept accessible for them so they can at least communicate to them and that they're not removed for infection control measures. Um, I have also spoken to a person, for example, who has a hearing impairment and they're dependent on lip reading. Before COVID-19, they were at a procedure, a surgical procedure, and everyone was wearing a mask. And this person was unable to communicate to their caregivers that they had a significant allergy. And as a result, they had a really poor outcome. So with COVID-19, healthcare providers wear a significant amount of PPE. And for someone dependent on lip reading or communication methods like that, this can be a significant challenge to sometimes get across critical medical information that might be life-saving or threatening their life. Similarly, and again, I'm not a person that is specialized in this area, but there are people that are dependent on ventilators in the community. In hospitals at the moment, um, ventilation in emergency departments are approached very cautiously because uh, there is some concern that ventilators and things might aerosolize virus particles and cause an expansion of infection in these departments. So for people that are dependent on ventilators in the community who might become affected by COVID-19 and would need to present to emergency departments, I think I would like to see some uh, information or at least consideration around that. So these issues in terms of ensuring that uh, people with disability continue to have access to the equipment that they ordinarily use for support in the hospital setting speaks to you, to the need to make sure hospitals turn their minds to those things and develop plans in advance. Absolutely. Okay. Just I've got a couple more questions before I hand over to the Commissioner. Can you share with the Commissioner a particular difficulty that you faced as a consequence of physical distancing roles? I recently, um, that there are annual surveillance requirements that someone with a spinal cord injury has to prevent the risk of, for example, bladder cancer and kidney stones. So there are annual requirements of the urinary tract that must be carried out. Recently, I was required to get a scan on my bladder and I attended a radiology clinic to do that. When you are getting a scan at one of these clinics, um, you're required to move on to a bed to do that. And it's not, it's, not all, it's not always that they have measures in place for someone to transfer onto such a bed. So I attended the clinic with two people so they could help me move on to the bed safely. When I came to the reception, the uh, receptionist told me that I can't have more than one person there, and uh, it, it, it was just to it was a very complicated process to have that one person that day to help me onto the bed. And when I told the receptionist that, they just told me that, well, that's just the way it is. So you'll have to cancel your scan today. And they had no solution for me to get on the bed. Yeah. And I think um, we have a population of people with disability that are already missing out on their regular care and regular follow-up because clinics are cancelled and access is more difficult. So that situation really showed me that the risks that people could run into. What specific research would you like to see done in the future and why to help people with pandemic in circumstances of a pandemic such as this? I am involved in the spinal cord research project and we have collaborators across the world and across the country and we were looking for data around how COVID-19 affects people with spinal cord injury for example. Apart from a couple of isolated case reports, there's not much data on how COVID-19 affects people with spinal cord injury 
And I think data is a really valuable thing. Uh, one of the things that would be great to see is more aggressive data gathering on how COVID-19 affects specific disabilities, not just medically, but socially as well. And I think gathering that data will allow us to build more research and better methods to protect people. And if there's one recommendation that you could make, which could be implemented, yeah. which would make a real difference to people with disability in a pandemic, what would it be? I think we've talked about a lot of complicated social and medical issues that people face, and there, there are so many different complications that we need to address. But I think that the most important thing is to look at this from a societal perspective. I think we've seen that the pandemic can be controlled and at least suppressed if we all gather around and do the right thing. I think the single most important thing that we can do is around messaging to our community. If we, I think if we told an Australian and any one of our citizens that if you sacrifice something little and if you sacrifice some comforts, you'll be protecting my friend who's ventilator dependent and you'll protect them and you'll allow them to have a few a more years of productive life. Or if you told them that you'll be protecting someone's granddad so they could they could hang out a bit more with their grandchild. I think that kind of messaging would I would suspect that every Australian would stand up and protect the vulnerable people in this nation and they would carry out the measures that our governments have put in place. So I think the single most important recommendation is to get the messaging out that by doing the right thing, we're protecting the most vulnerable people in our society. Before handing over to the commissioners, can I extend uh, my thanks to your, your mum for coming up with you today and her support of you and the commission. <coughs> Wish you all the very well, best with your admission and hand over to the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Counsel. <coughs> Thank you. Commissioner Bennett, no, Commissioner Gelb. Um, I'm, I'm just interested to ask you the degree to which you think um, that the inaccessibility of the health system has just been absolutely, you know, now really highlighted and that we, we always had a very inaccessible health system, really. Um, I'd like you to comment on that, if you could. Yes, Commissioner, and that's a really good point. I'm involved in at least two projects at the moment. One looks at accessibility in hospitals and the other looks at accessibility in primary care and even things like um, pathology and radiology clinics. So these things are, funnily enough, very inaccessible to people with disabilities. Um, and I think it's, it's something that's been highlighted more and more. I should also point out that our counterparts in rural Australia face even more difficulties in accessing healthcare, uh, and they're more more dependent actually on presenting to hospitals for even even the simplest of things. If you have a spinal cord injury, it's far easier to live in metropolitan Australia than rural Australia. So I think those uh, inaccessibilities are more amplified. Funnily enough, I have a medical colleague who uses a wheelchair that was based in New South Wales. And uh, when my colleague suffered their accident and started to use a wheelchair, their hospital says said that it was too risky to have them working in a hospital with a wheelchair, which is quite ironic since all their patients would be using wheelchairs at some point. Thank you. Um, Dr. Pelopana. How close did we come in Australia to having to ration uh, critical care? I know that was not an issue in Queensland, whether by um, good luck or management or a combination of both, but how close did we come? I put this question to an intensive care specialist recently and their response was, we, we haven't come close yet and we're well resourced, Commissioner. Good, thank you. Thank you very much for your statement and for coming today and giving evidence to the Royal Commission. We appreciate your contribution. Thank you.
and I thank the Royal Commission for this amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. The next witness is Christian Astorian. Mr Astorian's statement is at Tender Bundle B, tab 25, exhibit number 5.32, if it be marked in that respect. I also seek to tender a transcript of a YouTube video that Mr Astorian did a few years ago called Talking to a Stranger. It's a transcript that the Royal Commission has prepared and asked to be marked as 5.32.1 and to also um, mark as an exhibit a page of nine dot points that Mr Astorian has provided to the Commission just this morning, thank you, and ask that they be marked as 5.32.2. We yes, have Mr you. Astorian on the screen. Yes, thank you. Mr Storian, um, thank you very much for coming to give evidence. My associate will administer the oath for affirmation, if you wouldn't mind. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. I think Mr. Storian said yes. Yes, thank you. Now Dr. Melifont will ask you some questions, Mr. Storian. Good morning, Mr. Astorian. Thank you for joining us today. Is your name Christian Astorian? Yes. According. Thank you. You've made a seven-page statement dated the 29th of July, 2020. Is that correct? Yes, correct. And are the statements, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, definitely. Okay. Now, is it correct that you've worked as a disability advocate for over 25 years? Yes, correct. And I'm going to list some of your work, Mr Astorian. I'll just check these with you. Uh, you've been a member of the Advisory Committee for the Victorian Human Rights Commission, the Victorian Government Disability Service Commissioner Board, the new Victorian Government Disability Workers Registration Board, the Federation of Ethnic Community Councils of Australia Disability and the Disability Advisory Council for your local area. Is that correct? Yes. Go on. Thank you. And you have a particular interest in raising awareness of the challenges faced by people with disability from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you live independently and you work and contribute to the community as an active member. Yes. I do, and I need to clarify that I do live independently because of the support that I get every day from my support workers. Because if it wasn't for their support, I would not be here now talking to you and living my life the way I want to. You're able to live independently because of the support you get from your support, support workers. Correct. Okay. You are currently the manager of the Diversity and Disability Program at the Migrant Resource Centre 
Northwest region, St Albans, Victoria, a role you've had for nearly 15 years. Is that correct? Got it. And that centre helps people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, people with disability from those communities, to be more independent in their everyday lives and to speak out for themselves. Is that right? Yeah, uh, uh, definitely. Uh, and to be empowered for self-determination. And to be empowered for self-determination. Yeah. It's very important work, Mr. Christ Mr. Astorian. Can I confirm also that the centre provides a diversity and disability program, which is a disability self-advocacy program? Yes. And it runs um, support groups in easy English and with interpreters. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. Now... What I wanted to do, Mr. Astorian, if this is okay with you, is to read out the dot points that you've provided to the Commission, which I understand to be the key points you would like to communicate in your evidence today. Yes. Is that okay? Yes, thank you, Carrie. One, during the pandemic, the availability of support workers has gone down for a number of reasons, including that they do not feel comfortable working and would prefer to stay home and look after their own families. Support workers do not feel comfortable to work with new clients. It is also the case that some people with disability do not feel comfortable to work with new support workers. This has also meant that there is less availability of support workers. Number two, isolation is very dangerous because it can create even more situations of people with a disability, relying on very few or even only, even only one person to support them in their everyday lives. This issue can create situations of abuse and neglect for people with a disability. Number three, support workers in the disability sector are not considered healthcare workers and therefore they have to wait between five to seven days for COVID-19 results, which decrease the disability workforce yet again. Only a few testing sites have considered support workers to be essential healthcare workers. Number four, COVID-19 has exacerbated a situation that is already critical in the disability sector, particularly with support workers being employed on a casual term, not getting enough hours with one provider, and some working for different providers at the same time. Workers who work for different providers are more at risk of getting both infected and transmitting COVID-19. Number five, there are now government guidelines through DHHS on support workers wearing full PPE in supporting people with disability who are infected and can't wear a mask. Some providers don't have enough full PPE. Support workers don't have the knowledge, experience and expertise that medical staff in hospitals do to support infected clients with a disability. Six, there have been situations at the start of the pandemic where support workers have not been provided with personal protective equipment and have had to buy their own. Seven, COVID testing has been very challenging for people with a disability because of non-accessible venues in hospital and car park areas where the person with a disability 
doesn't have a car. Number eight, supermarkets have created a community hour, usually between 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. for people with disability and elderly people to have priority shopping. This time frame is not suitable to people with a disability. Number nine, having more police around has been stressful and left some people with a disability feeling less safe when out in their local community because of questioning by police about things other than COVID-19 more often than before restrictions. Police need better training about interacting with people who have a diverse range of disabilities. And your, uh, your dot points end with this general statement. Generally, the biggest issue I see, both at government and community level, is the very low expectation they have of people with a disability as citizens who achieve everyday life's goals. As long as this attitude doesn't change, people with a disability will never be considered as equals and have the same opportunities in life as ordinary citizens. Mr. Strain, can I thank you very much for that very well-considered document. Does it reflect the evidence you wished to provide to the Commission today? <laughs> And Tony Kerry, could you repeat the question? I just wanted to confirm that the information which I've just read out, that is the dot point document you provided to the Commission today, yes. reflects the evidence you wanted to give to the Commission today. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, do you have any question or any clarification? Yes, I'll just clarify a couple of things, Mr. Astorian, before I hand over to the commissioners. Mm -hmm. You speak about the supermarkets having created a community hour between 6 and 8 a.m., and that's not suitable for some people with a disability. Is that due to reasons such as it's too early for their support workers to come to them and to assist them to get to the supermarket on time? Uh, yes, uh, definitely, because uh, many people with a disability need at least two, two hours to get ready in the morning. So if the community hour is between 6 a.m., to 8 a.m., it means that the support worker we need to come at 4 a.m. to support the person with the disability. Uh, and this to me demonstrates again the lack of consultation from. Um, uh, the uh, retail sector <coughs> implement the community hours without proper consultation by people with a disability. Thank, thank you, Mr. Astorian. So as I, I understand your evidence here today and from your statement, People with disability may need at least two hours to get ready, which would mean the support worker and the disability, person with disability may have to start at 4 a.m. And you see an important need for there to be communication with the community before setting these community supermarket hours. Do I have it correct? Correct. Yes. Just want to clarify. Uh, ask you one more thing before I ask the commissioners um, if they have anything they have to ask of you, and that is um, you, as we mentioned before, you run support groups and that they use easy English. 
Is it the case, Mr. Astorian, that you believe that government messaging about the pandemic should first be translated into easy English and then into community languages? Yes, definitely, because that we simply find uh, the language in terms of uh, community getting the uh, information. And also, we need to consider that there are people within the community who cannot read in their own language. And generally, those people are even more isolated than other people in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Astorian. Uh, can I ask the commissioners if they have any questions for you? Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gelbley. Um, I would just like to ask Mr. Astorian a bit about his one-on-one -on -one support, the Nate that he's giving now in your role, um, because you've stopped running the groups. Uh, so just what the nature of the issues are that you're finding. I'm sorry to butt in. Could I just clarify um, that they ordin the uh, centre ordinarily runs five support groups, but we're down to two at the moment, which are running online through Zoom. Uh, some people haven't been able to connect online. Sorry to interrupt. So I'm just asking about the issues that are coming up for you as, a, as an advocate um, with your community. Uh, well, uh, uh, my role really around that is to provide the information that people uh, are not receiving from the government. So everything we get from the Department of Health and Human Services is circulated uh, to, to our client and our uh, consumers. Uh, and this is one of my role, really, Rhonda, because also as a self-advocate, my role is to support people who learn to look for information for themselves. So to make people to be more independent in their life, to look at what is available in the community for the best support that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Astorian, thank you very much for giving evidence. Thank you for your statement. And also thank you for the uh, additional points that uh, Dr. Melifont read out. As it happens, there has been some evidence, I think, about each of those points, and it's a very good summary of a lot of the evidence that we have received over the last uh, two and a half days. So thank you very much for your contributions to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you for giving me the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next witness is Damien Griffiths. His statement is Tender Bundle B, Tab 29, to be marked Exhibit 5.34. There is a supplementary statement at Part B, Tab 30, to be marked 5.34.1. There are a number of annexures in Tender Bundle E, Tab 52 to 54, 
to be marked 5.34.2 to 5.34.4 in the course of um, the evidence of Mr Griffiths will play a part of an extract um, of pre-recorded evidence from Ms Rymer. It's a tender bundle B, tab 26, five, to be marked exhibit 5.33. That's her statement. The pre-recorded evidence is at B, tab 27, to be marked 5.33.1. And there is a transcript of the pre-recorded evidence at B, tab 28, 5.33.2. Thank you, Dr. Alaphon. Mr. Griffiths, welcome back to the Royal Commission. And I will ask my associate to administer the oath or affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, Mr Griffiths. Uh, now Dr Melifont will ask you some questions. Can you state your full name, please? Damien Griffiths. You've made a 12-page statement dated 11 August 2020 and a two-page supplementary statement dated 13 August 2020. That's correct. Are the contents of those statements true and correct? Yes, they are. And your statements and your evidence today are made on behalf of the First Peoples Disability Network, of which you are the CEO and have been for at least 10 years. That's correct. Um, your qualifications and experience are vast, but in short, you've worked in the disability sector for over 30 years. Correct. And amongst... Your many current roles is being a member of this Royal Commission's First Nations People Strategic Advisory Group, correct? Yes. yes. Um, now, June Reimer is the Deputy CEO of FPDN. Yes. Okay. Ms Reimer has provided a statement, as I've indicated. I'll ask for her pre-recorded evidence to be played. Can I indicate that we will play uh, live just... An, act, an extract of it and indicate to those responsible for the technology that next time I stand up, if they can cease playing of the video and we'll turn to Mr Griffith's live evidence, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Could you state your full name, please? June Patricia Reamer. And you are the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the First People Disability Network Australia? Yes. You have over 40 years experience collectively across community care and disability industry, um, Aboriginal Development Officers, Aboriginal Home Care Manager and Program Development. Yes. And you also hold a Bachelor of Nursing, a Bachelor of Dental Therapy and Radiology, a Bachelor of Management and a Bachelor of Aboriginal Community Development. Yes. And you are a representative at the United Nations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with disability. Yes. And that's as a board member for the Commonwealth Disabled Peoples Forum and the Pacific Disability Forum. Yes. You are also a board member and Director for the Aboriginal Children's Advancement Society and an advisory member for many state and federal committees for Aboriginal disability. Yes. You've prepared an 11-page statement for this Royal Commission, which you signed on the 5th of August, 2020. Yes. And is that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and ability? Yes. And the evidence you give today and that within your statement represents your own views? Yes. And you also speak on behalf of the First People Disability Network? Yes. All right. Ms Rama, we've heard in the course of this pandemic that some people have had difficulty in obtaining food and other essentials. Can you please assist the Royal Commission to understand this particular issue in the context of some of the First Nations communities your organisation assists? 
So um, what we have to understand that most uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living with a disability already live in an impoverished state before the pandemic hit. So in regards to, um, you know, food security before and during this pandemic, it was always an issue because of low social economic um, participation and enablement to, you know, um, be available to, you know, for education or, you know, um, employment avenues, particularly in rural and remote regions. And what we saw during the pandemic, um, that availability even lessened due to um, not having support, you know, appropriate income support, but also in um, remote areas, there were already food shortages happen happening because of, you know, border closures and other um, extenuating circumstances in the community. So the basic um, fundamentals that people needed to you know weren't available anyway in very remote regions so and then the access to those because of their disability was you know another issue that impacted greatly on these um, individuals families and you know across many communities and do some of your communities need to travel across the border in order to purchase food ordinarily yes yeah, so in some people um, in New South Wales, we, we've seen that that um, on the border borders of Queensland, it's um, less you know kilometres for those groups to travel across to Queensland to um, bigger um, centres that um, may have more access to generalised food supplies. Where to come back down into New South Wales, they may be travelling three or four hours, and then because of you know, lack of um, appropriate income support, they don't actually have the, the petrol or sometimes even the car to get to those facilities. And if you heard um, anecdotes through your work of people actually doing those long drives or commutes and getting to the stores and finding that the shelves were bare? Yes, so um, that, that happened particularly up in um, Utopia, which is um, 250 kilometres for a lot of those communities to get to the nearest store. And we also heard it in Western New South Wales. So for many of those communities, they would come into Dubbo as a large regional centre where when they got there, all the basic um, utilities or food supplies that they needed were gone. So it was a round trip that they did for nothing. And at that stage in the early days of the pandemic, there was no other um, food supports or emergency supplies getting to, you know, a lot of those communities. And do you know why? Um, I just think, you know, this goes back to the generalised issue that um, people with disability, uh, as we would say, you know, they're, they're the last bastion to, you know, people being thought of or what their needs, you know, they need to access in community in general. So, you know, for people with disability, they're, they're living on um, the marginalised areas of community already and it, and it wasn't just, it's just not thought about, you know, how, how these people can be better supported, you know, particularly when a pandemic or other crisis happens, you know, people were... Um, in communities not you know disability is not acknowledged in general across communities and so then when you add that other label of being aboriginal being ab isolated there's many layers to why people are you know impoverished or disadvantaged and and this is a conversation that um australia needs to have thank you your statement speaks of a partnership with the al ishan foundation to provide care packages to First Nations communities. Can you please tell us about that? Yes, so um, they originally approached us. So they're um, an international foundation and charity that support generally, um, you know, overseas in war torn regions. And they originally um, rang us, first of all, to see, you know, how um, they could support communities. They were really concerned for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, it, the original conversation was also um, about, you know, the bushfire season and they, they'd they acknowledged that, you know, particularly in southern New South Wales, a lot of our community was still living homeless because, you know, um, of the bushfires. 
So um, after several conversations and um, emailing back and forth, we did, you know, they wanted to build a partnership with us and, but it was a collective partnership. They, they could supply the essential food packages, but it, um, FPDN actually had to distribute. So they were happy for us to nominate regions where they should go. Um, and, and it's been a fruitful partnership in regards to normally they don't deliver also, it was about picking up, but FPDN doesn't actually have that capacity. So we um, they delivered to regional areas for us and it was about FPDN then um, developing a volunteer workforce, developing um, a information sheet of the most vulnerable. And that came down to our workers in regions who knew families so we not only delivered to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with disability, but also, you know, the elderly. So, um, and then after that, we delivered to other vulnerable groups that we knew of in particular regions. And uh, with respect to the regions that you delivered to, were there some key regions which were in most uh, desperate need of assistance? Yes, so we, we started with um, the South Coast because um, that had been devastated, particularly our communities um, from now the Shellhaven region down to Bega um, because um, they were still having impacts from the previous, you know, bushfire season. Many are still to this day living in tents or, you know, um, caravans haven't been supported. And because um, for a lot of our communities, they'd lost their identity, so they weren't eligible for or didn't know how to navigate the um, government systems to get other supports in their life. So people were living day to day, you know, week to week in regards to, you know, handouts supporting them. So we we knew of that um, and, and that's a cultural thing um, in, in um, being a first um, person's um, disability organisation and our workers being key advocates on the ground. They knew communities and they knew who to um, contact. And once the word got out, which happens in our communities, they were contacting back to our workers on the ground and, and sharing information who, you know, needed these, this valuable support at this time. And when you speak about people having lost their identities, are you speaking about them having lost uh, records of identification that would ordinarily be used to navigate the system. Yes, yes. So they'd lost all their, you know, personal information, and um, and and for a lot of our mob, you know, it still goes back to, you know, not really understand how to navigate systems or how to work through, you know, sitting on a telephone line for an hour to get through, and people really, you know, when it goes to a central point of um, communications for government agencies, they're not understanding the stress and the vulnerability that people at that moment are in and and asking, you know, questions that might be, you know, relevant to their current situation. They're, you know, they're already living in a stressful environment and, and um, trying to do the best they can. And so we found there was a lack of compassion which kept coming through, um, you know, from the community. So they would give up rather than pursuing, you know, several telephone calls or accessing other entities that, you know, were government buildings that they felt marginalised anyway prior to the pandemic or prior to the bushfires. Thank you. If I can ask that that uh, recording be stopped now, that's an extract of a much larger pre-recall with Ms Reema, and I apologise for previously incorrectly pronouncing her name. Um, the full unedited pre-record and transcript will be tendered and I ask that they be marked exhibits 5.33.3 and 5.33.4 respectively. Um, now, Mr Griffiths, you've in fact read Ms Rima's statement and her full transcript, that's correct? Yes. yes. And, and in addition to the issues that we've just heard about, Ms Rima also speaks to issues such as um, access to education being very problematic during the pandemic, particularly in remote areas, 
children not having access to access to devices or to good internet connections and children falling behind. Financial struggles, given that the disability support pension only received two supplements of $750, whereas expenses increased significantly, particularly in regional and remote community areas where things cost more. She also spoke about the FPDN working with media to help engage with the community in a culturally appropriate way, the need for media to move away from a text-heavy environment and do more visual content, individualising communications in ways that are culturally appropriate. And at the end of her evidence, and very critically and importantly, she speaks of the need for more comprehensive data collection and mapping across Australia of First Nations people living with disability. Now, do you agree with the contents of Ms Rima's statement and pre-recorded evidence? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Can I turn then to a couple of additional issues, please? FPDN endorsed a statement of concern which was made by internationally recognised independent experts in the area of human rights, bioethics and disability. Is that correct? Yes. yes. And co-signed an open letter to the National Cabinet which outlined the immediate actions required for Australians with disability in response to COVID-19. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you also, um, at the outset of the pandemic, um, did uh, FPDN recognise the need for culturally appropriate community messaging? Yes, it, yeah, it, 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 experience of yeah, the disability yeah, yeah. It's our inception yeah, yeah. that we are well, yeah. some of the most disadvantaged of all Australians. This is because First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with disability often face discrimination based on their indigeneity and or disability. So the stakes are very high in terms of vulnerability to COVID. So as a consequence, we felt that it was critical that we be proactive. So we developed a range of information resources that were both disability and culturally accessible. So these included short animated films and a short film by the Deadly Deaf Mob for our deaf community. Thank you. And you found them to be effective communication mechanisms, is that correct? Yes, we definitely did. We also uh, participate in a number of media interviews, particularly with Indigenous media that has wide coverage across the country. And uh, feedback we received was that that was uh, a very valuable way to get information out. Thank you. Now, is it correct that in partnership with Professor Cameron Stewart um, and Professor Jackie Leach Scully that and their organisations, which is Sydney Health Law and the University of Sydney and the Disability Innovation Institute at UNSW, respectively, that FPDM developed an ethical decision-making for first peoples living with disability policy document, which outlines how the treatment of First Nations people living with disability should be prioritised and managed, is correct? Yes, that's correct. They were, those guidelines were finalised on the 27th of April 2020, is that correct? That's correct. And why were those guidelines developed? Well, over the existence of the First People's Disability Network, we've regrettably encountered many examples of institutional racism in the health system. Uh, indeed, it's... It's often the case that in particular regional based hospitals, that there is a reputation often of Aboriginal people experiencing racial discrimination. Um, and sometimes what can result is that Aboriginal people with disability, when they present at hospitals, they can be viewed or, or labelled as being drunk, or we can have covert or ca more casual forms of racism which can result in a less urgent response, for example, or we've known of incidences where Aboriginal people with disability have been turned away. So we were very concerned about that. 
we were concerned about a, a scenario, for example, where, say, a 50-year-old Aboriginal man with psychosocial disability who perhaps is a smoker um, may be triaged out of the health system. And we were basing this on the experience of African Americans in the United States and also people from Hispanic communities and also people from low socioeconomic communities. And we were also aware that in England and Wales, it's now being reported that as many as two thirds of the deaths are of people with disability. So we were very concerned and very nervous about scenarios where Aboriginal people who are considered to be ageing at a much younger age could be triaged, triaged out of the health system. So that's why we wanted to make a strong public statement to say that every Australian is valuable and every Australian has a right to the health uh, supports that they need. We were particularly concerned about the risk in terms of triage in related to intensive care. Uh, and we still have that concern with the way things are progressing in Victoria, but generally speaking, Australia appears to be performing well, but we certainly wanted to make a statement, a public statement. So, so in effect, you wanted to get on the front foot to raise this as a concern in Australia because you were deeply concerned about the vulnerability of First Nations people with disability due to the double disadvantage of disability and indigeneity. Exactly right. And we were also concerned that the the Aboriginal health plan, COVID health plan, uh, which was done in partnership between National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations and the Commonwealth Department of Health, despite being some 40 pages long, made no mention of disability. This is an all too common experience when you're dealing with an issue of intersectional discrimination. We don't get enough high enough profile in disability and we don't get high enough profile in Aboriginal justice, if you like, and we're walking in both those worlds. So what ends up happening is our, the needs of our people with disability sometimes get completely overlooked or only tokenistically mentioned. And Ms Rima spoke of the collaboration between Al Ishan and FPDN to deliver fresh food and key items to your community. I take it that was a welcome approach from Alashan. We were very grateful for that approach. Uh, it's a reality, as June said, that many Aboriginal people across Australia always experience risk around food security. It's not unique to the pandemic. We could provide care packs to many of our people across the country all of the time um, because one of the major challenges, particularly in regional remote Australia, is access to fresh produce and healthy food. It's not uncommon to see green price marks up, markups, for example. I've seen it myself only very recently, nine or ten dollars for a two litre bottle of orange juice, for example. If you live in poverty, you can't possibly meet those costs and you end up eating the cheap uh, takeaway food, if you like, and that has a serious consequence in, in terms of health outcomes. That's a constant problem across Aboriginal Australia. The pandemic has only served to highlight that. And your statement also refers to some members of community not having access to running water or experiencing a compromised water supply or not having access to hot water. And you make the point that the lack of access to a reliable water supply can clearly have serious adverse health effects and exacerbate COVID-19 risk. I don't believe that Australians know sometimes the extent of poverty experienced by Aboriginal Australians, particularly in re regional remote parts of the country. It is true that there are some Aboriginal people in Australia who can't access a reliable water supply or don't have access to hot water. Um, I think this is an issue that needs greater exposure uh, and it's frankly a national shame and it's a common experience for Aboriginal people, particularly in regional remote Australia, that they don't have access, access to the basics of life, the fundamentals of human rights. If you could just hold with me there for a minute, Mr Griffiths. Um, Chair, I will be about five to eight minutes more with Mr Griffiths. Would you like me to press yes, on I now would. or resume it to yes, a Please problem? do press on, and I'm sure Mr Griffiths would prefer that. Thank you. 
Has there been an increased demand for FPDN services over pandemic? Yes, there has. Um, our staff have been overwhelmed, frankly. Uh, we get calls from around the country, from every corner of the country, asking for a range of different supports. Sometimes these can be basic requests. Other times they're often very complex. Often what happens for some of our people with disability and their families, they make contact with us at absolute crisis point. They've exhausted uh, all the other avenues that they're aware of and they come to us seeking support. We're not funded for that work, but we never turn anyone away. Uh, June, my colleague, will often work late into the night and receive calls into the night asking for help. Um, so this goes out the, outside the, the normal remit of our work. It's evidence why we need a Aboriginal owned and operated disability individual advocacy scheme. We've needed that for a long time and we've been calling that for, calling for that for more than a decade. So we think it's time to get on with that. To, be, to, to just give a sense of the real personal nature of this, you've been getting calls from people who simply just can't get um, incontinence pads for their disability needs. It can range from exactly that issue to um, I need to get my wheelchair urgently repaired and I live in a remote community 500 kilometres from a large regional centre. It can be I can't access my medication uh, or I've lost my disability support pension, I've been taken off that. It can also relate to, and we had an incident only a couple of weeks ago, where we were asked to support a young Aboriginal woman with intellectual disability who had travelled from Melbourne, was travelling from Melbourne to Ballina on a plane, uh, not being aware of the rules. She arrived in Sydney to transit through and then she was placed into quarantine. She was deeply distressed and we had to provide some support to her. So that the issues range broadly, and but regrettably, often they are very, very urgent and require immediate action. Now, your supplementary statement sets out a specific recommendation, that is, you would like this Royal Commission to consider making a recommendation that the Commonwealth Government fund a 1-800 telephone number and text messaging service for FPDN so that members of First Nations communities from around the country can have a free number that they can call for help, guidance or direction about where to get help and support for First Nations people with disability, their carers and their family. And is that recommendation specifically in respect of help related to COVID-19? Yes, it is, but it's often going to be broader than that, but certainly it's in relation to COVID-19. Such a contact point needs to be in place for the long term. So a lot of Aboriginal people and a lot of Aboriginal people with disability do have access to mobile phones in regional remote Australia, but the cost to engage with phone-based support systems is prohibitive for many people. So that's the logical reason why we need a 1-800 contact point. But we have to, particularly during COVID, where we can't travel as an organisation, we have to, at the very least, it's a very simple model, be available to people to be able to give them advice. It's a very simple idea. I realise the government is investing heavily in what they call the online disability gateway, but that's not going to be accessible to the vast majority of Aboriginal people with disabilities. So that's why we need this standalone uh, system. And what do you see as being the specific benefits to First Nations communities specific to the COVID-19 of such a, such a resource? So it can act as a referral point. So we could potentially answer any sort of question around where your nearest uh, COVID testing place might be, provide more information on how to you know, maintain good personal hygiene, what do we mean by social distancing, anything really. Nothing would be off limits, anything uh, first person with disability needed help with. My last question, Mr Griffiths, in your view, what needs to happen in terms of recovery from this pandemic? So we would say three things. Uh, immediate investment in an Aboriginal owned and operated nationwide individual advocacy program. As I said before, we've been calling for this for a decade now. It's long, long overdue. Uh, the observation I would make, it seems that advocacy is a dirty word to government, to be honest, but this Royal Commission alone demonstrates the need for it. 
it would be great if FPDN didn't need to be in existence, but it does, and that is a reality. The second point we would say is the online disability gateway that's been heavily invested in by the, the Commonwealth Government is a resource, but I fear that there is a view in government that this will be the fix all for all things disability. The disability gateway will not be able to address the poverty experienced by many Australians with disability. It is utterly meaningless to an Aboriginal man with disability who is homeless living on the riverbed in a remote community, where it has nothing to contribute in terms of addressing overcrowded housing, for example, in, in some of our communities. The gateway is a resource. Individual advocacy is the conduit for meaningful change in the lives of all Australians with disability. And my final point is a development of a parliamentary accountable mechanism similar to closing the gap. FPDN has been advocating for this for some time now. Similar to the closing the gap structure whereupon every Prime Minister of the day has to make a statement to the Australian Parliament about the situation for Australians with disability. The potential measures are already there in the National Disability Strategy. We feel that this, if this was developed in partnership with the disability community, this could elevate the needs of Australians with disability into the public consciousness. Thank you, Mr Griffith. And can you pass our regards to Ms Rima, our Commissioners? Thank you, Dr Malafont. No. Commissioner Galbally? I think you said you don't have a question because you're not on. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted. No, thank you very much. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Griffiths, what is the um, Al, Il Al Issam Foundation? Yeah, so it's a, it's a foundation that operates mostly overseas um, and they approached us to provide support to our community because they knew there was a gap there. Um, we were very grateful to receive it. Um, it was a, it's a lovely partnership uh, across cultures which uh, has been a wonderful experience and a very positive one. Uh, and we've been very grateful for their kind donations. Their, the value of their donation is difficult to quantify, but we're very grateful to receive it. What, um, where is it based? What's the source of funding, do you know? I don't know, to be honest. I, I, I don't have that information um, about where they're resourced, but um, they're certainly Australian-based, but they do do overseas aid work also. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you again for yet another of your contributions to the Royal Commission, which are many, uh, and we hope that they will continue. Thank you again for coming today and for your evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Time for the lunch and adjournment, uh, Commissioner. It's two o'clock convenient for resumption. Just. 215, 210. I mean, you're, I'm, in, I'm in your. Can we, can we manage if we, if we have a break until 2.10? Will that be okay? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, okay. We'll resume at 2.10. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.
Right. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Dr. Melifont, yes. Thank you. The next witness is Dr. Jason Agostino. His statement is at Tender Bundle B, Tab 31, to be marked Exhibit 5.35. His curriculum detail is at Tender Bundle B, Tab 32, to be marked as Exhibit 5.35.1. Other related documents are at Tender Bundle uh, D, Tabs 59 through 69, capital A, to be marked as Exhibit 5.35.2. To 5.35.13. Thank you. I think we have uh, Dr. Agostino there. Uh, Dr. Agostino, thank you very much for giving evidence today. Uh, I'll ask my associate to administer the oath or affirmation to you. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Dr. Agostino, thank you. Uh, Dr. Melifont will now ask you some questions. You, I take it, are in Canberra. She is in Brisbane, and we are in Sydney. So let us hope all will be well. Great. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Can you state your full name, please? Jason William Agostino. You've made a 17-page statement dated the 12th of August 2020. That's correct. Are the contents of that statement true? They are. And your statement and your evidence today is made on behalf of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation known as NACHO for short. It is. You are a general practitioner and an epidemiologist. I am. And is it the case that most of your clinical work for the last 15 and a half years or so has been within rural and remote Australia? It has. And of that time, the last 10 and a half years approximately has been mainly in the field of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. That's correct. You are a medical advisor to uh, Nacho, a general practitioner to the Gurani Yalamaka, which is an Aboriginal community controlled health organisation in Yarrabah in fourth, far north Queensland, a lecturer at ANU and a research fellow at the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health. Is that all right? Yeah, um, all those things. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and there's 143 art shows across Australia providing about 3 million episodes of care yearly for over 400,000 400, people. That's correct. All right. Now, um, is it your understanding of, the, of available data that the percentage of First Nations people with disability is considerably higher than that percentage in the non-Indigenous population? Yeah, it's much higher than in non-Indigenous Australians. Okay. Now, is it the case that NACHO, together with the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, the Lawitja Institute, ANU, and expert clinicians collaborated to prepare the COVID-19 primary health guidance document, the purpose of which is to provide recommendations to support healthcare teams in the prevention and management of COVID-19 for First Nations people? That's correct. And uh, is that document a document which uh, is updated from time to time, seeking to respond to the rapidly changing environment we live in. Yeah, that's right. Some new guidance will be up soon. I want to ask you about the um, increased risks that coronavirus presents for First Nations people. Is there an increased risk of rapid spread and more severe impact for the First Nations population compared to the non-Indigenous population? 
Yeah, that's right. There's um, increased risk of both rapid spread and more severe disease. Uh, more rapid spread is due to crowded housing. So more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in crowded housing um, than non-Indigenous people. And often those houses have inadequate infrastructure. Um, and I, you know, I noted Damien highlighted the lack of water, um, you know, in terms of highlighting the sort of really crucial structures that are needed for cleaning um, in some houses. So in that environment with crowded housing, multi-generational families and, and poor access to cleaning, then there's potentially if one person in that house gets coronavirus, that it'll spread rapidly to the rest of the household. Risk of severity? Yeah, so the risk of severity has to do with the high prevalence and early onset of chronic medical conditions. We know that some conditions uh, mean that you're at higher risk of being admitted to intensive care or dying if you get COVID-19. Um, those conditions include heart disease, uh, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and emphysema or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And in all those conditions, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have high prevalence of those conditions, significantly higher than non-Indigenous Australians. And they also have an onset much earlier, sometimes 20 years earlier. Um, the final thing is that uh, more than any one condition, what confers higher risk of more severe disease is if you have two or more chronic conditions. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people frequently have two or more of these chronic conditions that we know confer or our outcomes with coronavirus. Now, I'd like to ask you about telehealth and your observations about the use of telehealth during pandemic insofar as it relates to the provision of health services to First Nations people. Yeah, so the pandemic has seen a rapid expansion of Australia's telehealth um, capacity and through that expansion, um, the government has been listening um, to some of the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities with most uh, Medicare items that are aimed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, available through telehealth. Um, the area where there's been less response and where there's some needs um, that haven't been met is around patient and support. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, for many of our patients, they're, they're not accessing telehealth, you know, in their home. They're, they're still coming into the clinic and they're in the clinic, they're accessing remotely based general practitioners, allied health professionals or hospital based specialists. And when they do that, they're often supported to do that by a locally based clinician, normally an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health worker or a practice nurse, or, or sometimes if they're seeing a specialist, they'll be supported by a general practitioner. And throughout the pandemic, all of that patient and support, well, not all of it, but nearly all of that patient and support has been provided with no remuneration to the health service. Okay. Now, without that support, it's the consequence that telehealth remains largely inaccessible to many First Nations people with disability? Yeah, there's a lot of barriers um, to accessing telehealth. Um, you know, in general, there's issues with connectivity and having sufficient bandwidth. Um, but then if you, for example, have got um, hearing impairment um, or impaired health literacy, then you really do need that support from uh, the patient and support to engage meaningfully and safely in telehealth. Your statement refers to there being some suggestions by um, some NDIS uh, workers that larger screens may help people, help some people with disability to engage better with a remotely based clinician. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think um, amongst the infrastructure that would support telehealth, you know, bigger screens would, would be a helpful addition. And is it your view that there needs to be more appreciation by government, both of the cost of internet connectivity to the patient and of 
the need to have enough bandwidth to engage in video conferencing. Yeah, where where possible, we do want people to engage in video, but the the costs are you know prohibitively expensive for that. So we need to find ways to you know support people to engage in video video telehealth facilities where possible. Now, are there particular funding challenges for providing patient end support? Yeah, there are. So one that preceded the pandemic and that is still an issue is about accessing specialists via telehealth. Um, in the current requirements for accessing funding for patient end support, the remote specialist needs to claim Medicare. And that then triggers that the clinic can claim patient and support. But the thing is, is that most of the patients that we see are seeing hospital-based specialists who don't um, bill Medicare. Therefore, even though our services provided that patient and support, they're not getting funded. Whereas if they were providing support to a private specialist, they would get funded. It's completely inequitable and, and needs to be changed. The okay. other thing... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Kerry. Please, please continue. Um, so the other thing is about now that we do have all these other health professionals that can be seen remotely via telehealth, we need to create equivalent uh, patient and support Medicare items to support, um, to, to help them seeing remotely based GPs, allied health professionals and psychologists. Okay. Now, do you see a remedy or remedies for these particular funding challenges? I, you know, those, these items exist. So um, if we remove the requirement for the remote specialist to claim Medicare, that will then make that more accessible. And then there needs to be new Medicare items created um, for patient and support. Okay. And new Medicare items for patient and support for what particular context? For if you're seeing a remotely based general practitioner, allied health practitioner and psychologist. And do you regard that those changes to, to Medicare, if they, are, if they are in fact made in the future, would be advantageous, advantageous for people with disability in general? That is, not just First Nations people with disability, but people with general disability in general across Australia? Yeah, I think for many reasons, patient end support is really best practice for, that can be best practice for people with disability. You know, it supports team-based care. Um, it helps with, you know, issues that may occurring around health literacy. Um, and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, if it's with an Aboriginal health worker, it supports culturally safe care as well. Have you seen challenges in First Nations communities where a member or members need to self-isolate? Yeah, as we discussed, many people live in crowded homes with multi-generations within the one household and there is really no um, adequate space within their own house for them to isolate safely. So if we're putting them into that environment, we're running a really high risk that they are going to spread coronavirus to other members of their family. Okay, so your statement speaks to the default model of isolation being for people in spacious homes who are able-bodied and who don't have caring responsibilities and that this is not the position for uh, first, many First Nations people with disability and that there's been no clear guidance provided on how a person may isolate if they live in a crowded home, have caring responsibilities or, or are themselves in need of care. There are opinions you hold and, and held when you wrote your statement? Yeah, that's correct. You know, speaking to um, NDIS workers around, you know, what might happen if people with significant, who are living on their own but have significant um, caring needs, if they were to quarantine, there is no clear guidance for those people about what to do. And can you assist the Royal Commission in understanding your belief as to the need for culturally appropriate psychological and medical support proactively arranged for people in isolation? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if we are going to support people uh, through a 14-day isolation period, we need to be engaging them early in both psychological supports and in medical care. You know, people often don't know how to seek out 
medical care or psychological support. So it can't be something that we just assume people will request. It needs to be something that is built into how we provide isolation and quarantine. Um, and when we talk about culturally safe care, there's people that are familiar with caring for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and can provide the appropriate care there. And that need arises out of a concern um, that mental health can can decline and rapidly decline in circumstances of isolation for First Nations people. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I want to move now to the topic of contact tracing and ask you whether it's your impression that some privacy requirements have produced an impediment to optimal contact tracing? Yeah, that's correct. Um, the staff within our health services are highly skilled in contact tracing, and that's been used to good effect with other infectious diseases. But we've found, we've been reported to us through this pandemic that often um, those skills amongst our Aboriginal health workers aren't being used to effectively and efficiently contact trace. Okay. So from your experience, you believe that ARCHOs may be able to offer support to the efforts of public health units through contact tracing and to provide psychological support. Is that correct? That's true. Two of the reasons you hold that view is because, in your experience, ARCHOs, um, at least some of them, will have familiar familiarity with that process because they've done it before for other diseases and that there is um, a degree of community trust and knowing how and where to find people. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. You know, often um, people might not, uh, for whatever reason, their phone might be disconnected, they might not be at the one residence, they might be living between a couple of homes. And, you know, within Yarrabah, where I work, um, the community members have always been invaluable in helping find where people are and also having conversations around contact tracing that are more likely to provide useful information in terms of controlling the pandemic. And does this issue link, in your view, to the importance of government working closely with First Nations communities in their efforts to combat COVID? Yeah, that's right. I think there's been an underappreciation through this process of the public health functions of Aboriginal community controlled health organisations. They've got obviously a great deal of expertise in communicating public health messages, but also in doing contact tracing and, and helping control spread. In paragraph 33 of your statement, you say there needs to be better communication of positive test results coming back to general practitioners. What's been the problem? Uh, look, across the board, we've heard multiple reports that um, general practitioners haven't been informed of positive results or, or negative results for their patients. Most of our testing is occurring outside of our clinics, so we're reliant on state-based clinics or Commonwealth-funded clinics to inform us of a positive result. And in many cases, that has not been occurring. Okay. And your, your view is that general practice, practitioners are a very important resource for supporting the patient through this time when they, they get a positive COVID result. So it's important that they are advised. That yeah, look, yeah, that's correct. You know, the vast majority of uh, patients that are uh, positive will end up being managed in the community. And in that case, their, their GP and their local clinic is vital to the management of the illness. Okay. I want to move now to the ATSI COVID-19 advisory group. And you sit on that group, is that correct? That's correct. And it was established in the first week of March to advise on health issues related to COVID-19. And it reports the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and it has representatives from each state and territory, general practitioner experts plus uh, First Nation expert epidemiologists, correct? That's correct. Um, now, if I can move through this relatively quickly because it is set out in your statement, 
um, you consider that the rapid formation of that group uh, was a recognition of the threat that COVID-19 posed to First Nations people? Yeah, the, um, the last pandemic, uh, H1N1 in 2009, that disproportionately impacted Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There was five times the rates of hospitalisation and death. And reflecting upon that, one of the limitations was um, limited policies and programs for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So this was set up to address that gap from the previous pandemic. Okay. I want to move now to paragraph 45 of your statement, which says that up until now, the case rates for First Nations people are approximately one third of the case rates for non-Indigenous people. And that the statistics also tell us that 1% of COVID-19 cases nationally is amongst First Nations people. What can we take from those statistics? Yeah, so just to clarify what I meant by that, you know, we know that 3.3% uh, of the Ab Australian population is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, and therefore we would expect um, that 3.3% of cases would be, of COVID-19 positive cases would be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But in fact, it's, it's less than 1%, um, which is a very positive news for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and speaks to the strength of the response. Um, what we can take from that is first uh, to give the due credit to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their communities. They identified the potential um, threat of coronavirus to their communities, in particular elders, and were very proactive in putting in uh, measures to educate population and to also protect their population. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, uh, this success has highlighted that um, if the, the, the government prioritising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experts, you know, gets results. You know, we are now five months into this pandemic and we continue to um, have lower case numbers than we expect. Any, any, any case is, is unwanted, but, um, you know, and I think a lot of that has become due to listening to experts, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and experts in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Do these comparatively low rates mean that we can relax, that we can take, take our foot off the pedal? No, definitely not. You know, because of those vulnerabilities that we spoke about in terms of uh, rapid spread and in terms of um, more severe disease if it gets into the population, you know, that means we need to continue to be really proactive in communicating, in, uh, in doing targeted communications for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and also supporting um, communities to implement interventions to, to protect their communities. Okay. Uh, have any of the ARCHOs communicated to you any spe spe specific difficulty um, with communication from Commonwealth Government or the NDIS or, or the uh, NDIA? Yeah, they have. So in some areas um, where NDIS coordinators and where the community connector programs are working, you know, communication has been able to work well. And, you know, we've been able to use community connectors to, to communicate messages to um, people with disability around coronavirus and what's available to them. But where those, uh, where that integration doesn't exist and where the Aboriginal community um, and people with disability in particular is reliant on mainstream NDIS providers, we're finding that those messages aren't getting through clearly and people aren't aware of what services are available to them throughout the pandemic. Does this highlight the need for the importance of locally tailored and culturally appropriate information by uh, NDIS, QSC and its agency and the, and the, yeah. and the yeah. agency rather? So, yeah, it, it does. You know, we've seen um, that our health services have been really effective in communicating general health messages, and I think we need to support them to also communicate more specific messages for people with disability as well. All right. Are you aware that there are some concerns amongst health practitioners about First Nations people, including 
First Nations people with disability refusing testing? Yeah, we have heard some reports that um, there have been some refusals and some concerns around the test itself. Um, you know, we want to maintain a really high rate of testing so that we can detect coronavirus as early as it enters into the community. So is the perception that the test or what people believe the test involves is a, is a barrier to client pre uh, people presenting for a test? Yeah, I think that is one of the concerns. Um, people are really concerned about, you know, pain associated with the test and things like that. So um, targeted communication that sort of explains for the community what the test involves and perhaps some high profile people having the test, I think will go a long way to allaying those concerns. And you indicated that testing rates are important. And your view is that uh, high testing rates is key to monitoring and controlling COVID-19, is that correct? 100%. Um, the higher the testing rates, the more the earlier we're going to detect it circulating in any community. Okay. So, and finally from me, um, Nacho's recommendation to seek to try to uh, address this perception um, that the test is not something you want to put yourself through, I suppose, is that Australian government ensures its communications be expanded to include descriptions and videos of prominent First Nations people getting the test, to take the myth out of it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I think that would go some way to um, allaying people's concerns. So you, your belief is that having examples of and understanding how the test works in practice will actually help to dispel any residual fear or concern in getting the test and that a more That's informed and that a more informed public will result in a rise in the number of tests conducted. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Argostino. They they are the questions from me. I'll hand to the commissioners. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bennett. Com uh, Commissioner Gelbley. Um, thank you very much. Look, I just wanted to, um, I'm sure that you've covered this, but First Nations people with disabilities network are very involved with, with, your, with the advisory group and the whole rollout from your point of view. Um, yeah, I think I, I was listening to Damien's um, testimony before and, um, you know, he pointed out that the management plan doesn't include uh, specific mentions of uh, actions for First Nations people with disability. And I, I, I accept what he's talking about, intersectionality and how it can be left out. You know, I think um, sometimes, well, often, you know, considering the high prevalence of disability, when we're making plans, we're implicitly thinking about people with a disability, but I, I think that, you know, he's made a good point that we need to be more explicit about those plans for people with disability at times. Thank you. Um, Dr. Agostino, who was responsible for setting up the advisory group? Uh, it was really led by Nacho, um, so my organisation here, and Dr. Dawn Casey um, is the co-chair of that with uh, Dr. Lucas Totoka, who... Um, works within the Depart Australian Government Department of Health. So th those two co-chair it and, um, and the department runs the secretariat for it. The composition of the, of the group includes uh, quite a number of people within various departments, uh, but it was essentially the Indigenous organisations themselves that were the moving forces, were they? Well, yeah, so we'd already... Um, I, it, I missed the first, anyway, for, for reasons not to get into, I missed the first meeting. Um, but, you know, that was based on uh, the community controlled sector wanting to come together and be more informed about, um, you know, COVID-19. And from that became this advisory group with the department um, supporting that. So it has representatives from each state and territory health department, but also each state and territory ARCHO affiliate. Well, it's striking that it was set up so early in the piece. 
Yeah, I think, you know, if we look back to some of the communications that were happening, you know, there was significant communications happening in February. I think the um, community controlled sector understood uh, what this could possibly mean for their communities and was very, um, you know, wanted to be on the front foot and to protect their communities and to prevent what happened in 2009 happening again. Yeah. Um, I have noticed, that, of course, the relatively low rates of uh, COVID-19 infection among First Nations people. It's readily understandable that those low rates have occurred in jurisdictions like Western Australia and the Northern Territory, which took, as I understand it, very substantial and um, rigorous measures in order to ensure that uh, remote communities, for example, were not exposed. But what, what, in your view, was the most important consideration that has or factor that has prevented infection in urban communities, where, as you say, most First Nations people do live? Look, it's always hard to pin it on one individual action. I think, you know, really it is about leadership by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their and the community controlled organisations in there and and the government's listening to that. I think there's been excellent communication um, and those health services in those regions have done, especially in Victoria, you know, where we're seeing a, a lot of cases, they've done exceptional work in, you know, not only educating their page, their patients, but also supporting people that do test positive for COVID-19 or that have to quarantine um, for various reasons. So, you know, really, I think that the success is, is because of the actions that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have taken themselves. Recognising the point uh, that you made to Dr. Melipon that, of course, nobody can afford to relax at this point in the pandemic. Would it be fair to say that so far this has been a very successful response as far as the protection of uh, uh, First Nations communities and in particular First Nations people with disability? Yeah, I think at this stage it, it is. But as I said, you know, because of those risk factors, we, 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 we can't relax and we're not relaxing. Thank you. Dr. No Agostino, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your statement, for coming to give evidence and for the work that you are doing. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me. The next two witnesses are Claire Robbs from Life Without Barriers and Andrew Richardson from Aruma Services. Both of these parties have been granted leave to appear. I understand the parties are still coming into the virtual waiting room, so if I might just deal with some of the formalities to start with. Aruma Services is uh, represented today by Ms McLeod of Senior Counsel, instructed by Minta Ellison. Life Without Barriers is represented today by Ms Mitchell Moore of Senior Counsel, instructed by Cause Chambers Wesker. Well, perhaps, uh, Dr Melifant, I should uh, invite uh, the legal representatives of the parties given leave to appear to announce their own appearances. Thank you. I, I, oh, please, Your Honour. Go ahead. Uh, Whoever wants to go first, please yes, go I, first. Yes, I've, I've leapt in. Thank you, Your Honour. Your Honour and Commissioners, please. Um, I appear for Aruma Services and Mr Richardson, the CEO of Aruma. My name is... McLeod and I am instructed by Minter Ellison. Thank you very much, Ms. McLeod. You can do away with the Your Honour stuff. Um, doesn't apply anymore. Yes. Yes, may it please the Commission. My name is Anna Mitchell Moore and I seek leave to appear, uh, instructed by Cause Chambers Westgarth for Life Without Barriers and for the witness, Ms. Claire Robbs. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Moore. Uh, are there any other appearances other, those, other than those previously announced? If not, Dr. Melifont, please continue. Thank you. Sorry for jumping in with those appearances myself. I didn't realise everybody was in the virtual space. Can I, I'll start, though, with um, the formalities of where the material is. The statement of Andrew Richardson is tender bundle G, tab 1 be marked Exhibit 5.250. The Aruma response to a notice provided, uh, given by the Commission to Aruma, Tender Bundle G, Tab 2, to be marked Exhibit 
Attachment, yes, attachments to the statement are attended under G, uh, tabs 3 to 47, to be exhibits 5.250.1 to 5.250.45. Other documents are at G, tabs 4850A, to be exhibits 2.52, to, for, sorry, to be exhibits 5.252 to 5.254.1. The statement of Ms. Robbs is at G tab 51 to be exhibit 5.255. A supplementary statement is at G tab 51 to be exhibit 5.270. The LWB response, Life Without Barriers response to a commission notice is at G, tab 52, exhibit 5.256. The attachments to the statement are at G, tabs 53 to 72, to be marked exhibits 5.255.1, dash 5.255.20. Other relevant documents related to Ms. Robb's evidence are at G, tabs 73 to 84, Exhibits five to be marked exhibits five point two five seven to five point two six eight. Might the witnesses be affirmed? Yes, thank you very much. All that will be done. I will read you both the affirmation. At the end, please both say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. I think we're waiting on one other. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Dr. Yes. Melifon, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Robbs, if I can start with you, please. Can you state your full name? Claire Elaine Robbs. Are you the Chief Executive Officer of Life Without Barriers? I am. Did you commence at Life Without Barriers in 2004 and then hold various roles across training, quality and management before becoming CEO in 2011? Yes. Do you have a degree in sociology and social policy, a postgraduate degree in psychology and an and an Executive Master of Business Administration? Yes. Do you have over 20 years experience working in disability, mental health, aged care and out-of-home care services? Yes, I do. In your statement and in your evidence here today, do you speak on behalf of Life Without Barriers? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr Richardson, could you state your full name, please? Andrew Donald Richardson. Are you the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Aruma Services? Yes, I am. Do you hold a degree in law, a degree in computer science and an MBA? Yes, I do. Are you currently a non-executive director of Special Olympics Australia and a member of the National Disability Insurance Agency's Industry Reference Group? Yes, I am. Can I ask you a little more about Aruma? Now, is it the case that Aruma, or Aruma Services, but from time to time I'll just say Aruma, is one of Australia's largest, largest providers of support services to people with disability across New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and the ACT? Yes, that's correct. Is it a not-for-profit organisation and a registered charity? Yes, it is. Have you held the position of CEO since 2006? Yes, I have. And does Aruma support approximately 5,400 customers employing close to 5,800 staff across the disorganisation, including 499 supported employees with disability? Yes, that's all correct. And in very short terms, does Aruma deliver a broad range of support services to adults and children with disability, 
including supported independent living, flexible supports, support coordination, therapeutic services and supported employment. Yes. I turn to you, Ms. Rods. Is Life Without Barriers also a not-for-profit organisation and registered charity? Yes, we are. And does it work in more than 530 communities from remote outback to major cities and provide services to more than 23,600 people, including 6,000 adults and children with disability and employs over 7,000 staff? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> so an extract of your business organisational chart in your statement indicates that there are a number of different areas of work that Life Without Barriers do, and that disability, aged care and mental health services are just part of that work. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. A significant part nonetheless. Yes, indeed. So Ms Rob, since the pandemic commenced, have you also been a participant in a number of committees, including the COVID-19 Disability Working Group, which is a committee chaired by the CEO of the NDIA and which includes representatives of disability sector groups, the NDIS Minister's Office, the NDIS QSC and the Department of Social Services. That's the Commonwealth yes. Department. Okay. And are you also a participant in the charity, philanthropy and fundraising advisory of the National COVID-19 Coordination Commission? Yes, I am. And do the terms of reference of that group include the gathering of information from the sector on the impact COVID-19 is having on vulnerable Australians and advising on how responses by the sector, businesses, the community and government could be better tailored to meet their needs and identifying barriers to organisations to continue to deliver vital services to the community? Yes, that that's yes, that's correct. And by the term vulnerable Australians, is that intended to include some people with disability? Yes, that is. What's the reporting mechanism and dates with respect to reporting of that committee? And that committee and report straight through to Prime Minister and Cabinet. The, Nash, the COVID Commission and the group that I was part of was a working party advising into the COVID Commission. Now, Ms Rob, you've provided a 43-page statement dated the 14th of August and a 25-page statement dated the 19th of August 2020. Are the contents of those statements true and correct? Yes, they are. And Mr Richardson, you've provided a 37-page statement dated the 16th of August 2020. Are the statements of that, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. Now, Ms Rob, can I please start with, with you and with an over, a, a brief overview. This is dealt with at length in the statements and, and same with your response, your statement, Mr Richardson. But just dealing with some things here, um, Ms. Rob, in response to the pandemic, you took on the role of national controller for the Life Without Barriers COVID-19 response. You did that on the 16th of March, 2020. Yes, that's correct. All right. So that means you're working with your national emergency management team on the pandemic response? Yes, Is it correct that part of that response included a communication strategy which itself included the introduction of a COVID-19 call centre? Yes. Okay. Now, as I understand it, that's a 1-800 hotline run by trained staff 24-7 for people with disability, their families, carers and staff to um, discuss inquiries and other information about COVID? Yes. Does it contain language service and options for uh, people with hearing impairment? 
It does have access to those services. Um, they would be requested then when the person contacts the call centre. Okay. How does Life Without Barriers monitor the questions and feedback provided to the hotline? There is a comprehensive review and report provided through to the National Emergency Management team and myself daily on both the, the reports in regards to the numbers of reports and also the content of those reports in a summarised form and also any trends that are coming up from the reports that we feel is something we need to attend to, either through more communications, MM decisions or any other support for um, our clients, our families or our staff. Okay. Now, your statement sets out the way in which you sought to communicate um, specifically with people in enclosed residential settings, people who don't have computer or internet access, and people with cognitive, intellectual or developmental disability. But what I want to ask you about now is uh, communication strategies in respect of people who are from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So I note that your statement at paragraph 64 says that translating and interpreting services are made available as needed including in relation to the call centre to ensure that service users from cold backgrounds can access information about COVID-19 and changes to services and restrictions to disability service users. I just want to ex explore that paragraph. So it refers to people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds accessing information. Does this require self-initiation by them? May I refer to my statement, if that's helpful? Most certainly. So it's page 16, page 16, at the very bottom, paragraph 64 commences, and it goes over to uh, the top of page 17. Thank you. Yes, so we're aware that um, a number of the people we support and our, a number of our staff, English is not their first language. So we do provide access to translator services and also do actually translate material. One of the reasons being we have also in Life That Varies a large program that supports refugees and we therefore have a lot of communication strategies there to make sure that we're able to translate our material to the language groups of the people that we support, um, as well as people being able to come to us for um, support to access translator services or material that met their language needs. We also provided the ability for our local staff to come to us to request if they were aware that a particular family or colleagues or a particular client required translation. The Commission heard evidence earlier this week from Ms Sarah Yaya, who works in communications and particularly for people in the cold background, and she spoke about the need to really have um, carefully tailored um, communication strategies and to take into account that some people, particularly refugees, may have come from a very um, traumatic or torture background and the need to ensure that communication strategies um, take into account those features, including aspects of trust. Has Life Without Barriers um, engaged to that level in their communication strategies for the cold communities? Or is that something you might want to delve in deeper in the future? I think we do have, we do understand the issue um, that has been identified because of our support for refugees. However, that being said, we actually have had um, lower than expected requests for information and we've produced lower than expected um, uh, variations in language material, which tells us that we're not um, offering that as in as helpful a way as people might need us to offer that. And in hindsight, something that actually we need to be more assertive in the way that we provide those resources, but also that service.
to people. And that's definitely an improvement for us. We haven't had any direct feedback to indicate that people's needs haven't been met. But just merely on the lack of demand makes us think that it's something we need to take a different approach towards moving forward. Thank you. Dr. Melifon, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'd just like, if I might, to get a better understanding of, of the services uh, that Life Without Barriers provides. And I apologise if the material is in here and I haven't fully appreciated it. Ms. Robs, would you would you explain who your customers are? <laughs> what are the what are the categories of? Uh, and I think customers is the word you use, don't you, to describe the um, people who receive your services? We we tend to use clients actually. Clients. Um, well, that, uh, that's fine. Whatever the term okay. is, could, yeah. you, would you mind just explaining, at least for my benefit, who the clients are? Yeah. So the largest group that we support are people with a disability and they are generally adults with an intellectual disability and that's across the country, so in all states and territories. We also have a large child protection programme and that's predominantly children that aren't able to live with their families anymore and have been taken into state care and we provide foster care, mainly those children. We also provide services to people who are here seeking asylum and are awaiting the outcome of their visa status and refugee services. And people who would be in the community that would need support to live in the community independently. So people with mental health challenges, older Australians, and those um, requiring support with uh, drug and alcohol challenges as well. Really, in, in summarising, we really are focused on um, people who live independently in the community but need additional support to enable them to do that safely and well. What proportion of your clients, if you know, are people with disability of one kind or another? Um, so our disability service is the largest part of our um, organisation. We support um, just over um, 5,500 people with a disability. And overall, in a year, the organisation would support just over 22,000 people in some sense. The difference is that in our disability services, the majority of people who we support there require not maybe 24-7 support, but certainly reasonably intensive support to live in the community. While some of the other services, like our refugee services, it's a much, much lighter service that we provide. It's not as intense in their life. And uh, your, uh, the proportion or numbers of your clients who are, on the ND, who are participants in the NDIS? So all of the people within our disability services program are participants in the NDIS. All of them. And can I just ask something that, uh, again, may be due to my lack of understanding. Um, at paragraph 65 of your statement, you say that at the 9th of August 2020, uh, you give some figures as to the number of uh, staff clients uh, who uh, have had confirmed COVID nine have had uh, are confirmed as having COVID nineteen, and I think there are some rather what seem to be rather different figures that are given el elsewhere. Um, for example, in your witness statement, paragraph five talks about two staff being confirmed, one supported independent living client, and then over the page. Um, there's 13 group homes in which there have been COVID positive infections, uh, COVID-19 infections confirmed. I'm just a bit confused as to what the figures actually are. Would you mind clarifying that for me? Yes, certainly um, I can try. So my understanding is that there's a different, um, different figures because they refer to different time periods. So the in the main statement in... Point sixty-five. That is our; those are our numbers as at the 9th of August. Yeah. In the my second witness statement at point five, um, those are the numbers as at the 18th of June. 
and, and, over, the and <laughs> over the page at paragraph six, there, there were outbreaks were there at 13 group homes between the 9th of August and the 19th of August. And so that relates to all of the notifications that were made through the Safeguarding Commission. And um, I apologise, I'm not sure if that is also up to the 9th of August or indeed it was requested to a third date. Um, I, can, I can confirm that, sorry. Perhaps it would be helpful uh, if uh, after you're finished today, if you could let us know just what the figures are up to date and in some uniform way, it would be quite helpful. Of course. Dr. Melifont, I apologise for interrupting your questions. I shall now, I shall now keep quiet for a little while. Um, can I just indicate our understanding, Ms Rob, so that this can be checked uh, subsequent to your evidence, is we understand in summary, the evidence to be that from the period of commencement of the pandemic until 18 June 2020, two staff were confirmed positive and one SIL client. That from the period 18th of June to the 9th of August, a total of 14 staff and seven clients, and that as at Last night, late last night, um, the time of the statement, uh, and, and no criticism, uh, given we asked for it just shortly before yesterday, uh, that there are 13 group homes where a COVID-19 positive infection is confirmed in respect of either staff or clients. Yes, that's my understanding. Thank you. Okay. Can I... Then come back to the questions that I was asking about, uh, that is, communications with respect to the cold community, uh, but ask now, um, Mr Richardson, if I can ask you in terms of your communication strategy for that particular group um, and appreciating that that particular group is, in fact, constituted by many different communities, was there a particular emphasis or particular consideration given with respect to the way in which COVID information was disseminated or, or provided to people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds? Uh, yes, it was quite a challenge in that the information and the need to communicate has been very fast moving. Uh, we've pursued a sort of a broad two-pronged approach. So one is to use electronic mail and website, and other forms of communication where we have access to online communication technology. So, for example, if you go to our website, you can translate any of the information there into multiple languages. Um, but I think the, the main way we have sought to communicate with people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, uh, given the nature of the pandemic, has been at a local level through local staff who already have relationships and effective communication channels with those customers, with those family members. Can I ask you whether your communication strategy has a, has a particular um, um, specialisation, I suppose, with respect to First Nations service users? No, it doesn't. Okay. And... Um, Ms. Rob, same question. Yes, so we did produce particular material both for our First Nations um, clients and, and for our First Nations staff. Okay. Um, and Mr. Richardson, is that an area that you might give further consideration to into the future? Yes, it's an area that we are giving further consideration to. Um, I think when we get to reflect on the lessons learnt to date. There are lessons around communication to minority groups and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and also striking a balance between communication and consultation in a fast moving context such as the pandemic. Yes, and we will come um, to the challenges of um, the information uh, highway, if I can call it that in this very fast-moving environment we live in. Um, Ms. Robert, paragraph 21 of your statement, 
which is page six. In response to a question asked by the Commission, did life without barriers restrict access by external visitors to disability accommodation? You state that decisions regarding access by external visitors were made to ensure compliance with public health orders and stay-at-home directives that have been enforced and amended from time to time across the various states and territories of Australia and that where life without barriers placed restrictions on access by external visitors in the early days of the pandemic, the restrictions, restrictions were, generally speaking, consistent with standards applicable in the general community. And then you say that where there are special vulnerabilities of certain clients which place them at a higher risk of infection and or complication, local staff had the flexibility to consider implementing access restrictions in addition to those required by public health orders and that access restrictions therefore varied between locations and over time. First, a short question. Do I understand that to mean, therefore, that there was a level of discretion vested in uh, local staff about the extent of restrictions that could be placed uh, in their particular locality? Yes, there was a level of discretion within guidelines provided at an organisational level. Okay. Was there oversight in respect of ensuring that the, that discretion was exercised in a proportionate way? And by that I mean by balancing safety concerns with the, the fact that uh, for example, group homes are people's homes, which should involve a certain degree of liberty. Yes, it's um, it was a really challenging um, area for us to navigate, I think, as an organisation, because there were such competing views from our clients and their families and indeed our staff about exactly that balance that you speak to, the safety and well-being. Um, I'm confident that we articulated the way that we wanted this to be managed as an organisation and we most certainly were clear no unilateral um, exclusion for any visitors to home that we really felt that we were clear about um, essential visitors being families and friends and people that were important to our clients. Where we allowed discretion was where perhaps someone had a particular health need that left them more vulnerable to the virus. And that was um, decided then in consultation with family. So, some family, for example, chose not to visit their sons or daughters in this time because either they or their son or daughter had a complicated health need that they felt was a risk. We monitored this through our visitor checklists and our visitor sign-in books, which we kept at all of our homes. And then they were part of the assurance check, both at a house or group home level. And then there was a second level of assurance from our safety, health and safety team across the country as well. Can I ask Mr Richardson, um, I want to take you to paragraphs 14 and 16, which again deals with this issue of restrictions. And paragraph 14 says that restrictions were applied to different forms of support at different times in response to the state-based public health orders and subject to the consideration of the level of community transmission within a particular region. And the paragraph goes on, I won't read it all out. <clears throat> um, but I am trying to, under trying to understand, uh, again, the same question, was there a level of discretion reposed in the locality as to what restrictions um, could be imposed 
And, and if so, what was the oversight mechanism to make sure that it w they weren't being imposed disproportionately? Well, no, no we, we sought not to give discretion. Um, I think you'll see in a number of the annexes to my statement that our policies and our communications spelt out as clearly as we could our interpretation of the public health um, directives or the care facilities directions enforced in that state in that time and then followed that up with frequently asked questions and the like. Try and communicate as clearly as possible what our expectations of our staff were in that setting. Um, clearly restrictions varied by service type. For example, we closed our community hubs, I think it was on the 26th of March, in response to the directions about social distancing and when you couldn't, could and couldn't access the home. Um, whereas in support of living, you don't go and close someone's home. Where we sought to have discretion was to maintain discretion as much as we could within those public health con guideline contexts um, for our customers. So, for example, we consulted with our customers individually if they wished to attend, for example, another provider's day program after that directive was in place. And we might have spoken with their families if that was appropriate. But ultimately, whilst we encouraged people in certain directions, we respected their choices and supported them in those choices. What's the oversight um, mechanism Dr. to Mellifont, make... I, Sorry, Dr. Mellifont, myself imposed silence has come <laughs> to an end. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand how this works. And I apologise again if uh, there's material that should have enabled me to follow this. Paragraph 21, um, Ms Robs, of your statement, states that where the special vulnerabilities of certain clients place them at higher risk of infection, etc., local staff had the flexibility to, considering, to consider implementing access restrictions in addition to those required by public health orders. We, if we confine ourselves to supported independent living. These are people, I take it, with disability living in their own accommodation. I'm sorry, Commissioner, could you repeat the uh, paragraph reference, please? I'm talking about uh, Ms Robb's paragraph oh. 21 of her statement. Sorry, Ms. these are... Did you hear my question? I'm sorry. I did, thank you, yes. So the, the paragraph 21 is referring to people who would be in what we would call group homes, generally. I see. That That's limited to group homes, is it? Um, um, group it homes. Say, sorry? It doesn't say so. But. Yes, I think we have... Um, Assume that perhaps from the question that references disability accommodation, and we would usually use that language to mean some uh, um, group home that we were then responsible for, rather than someone's personal home in the community where we just go in and provide service. I take it that with supported independent living, you wouldn't regard yourself as having authority to limit access to the person. Services came about really about trying to reduce the number of people um, entering and coming through the group homes in any one time in an effort to try to um, uh, I guess, support people's safety and reduce the risk of the virus being spread. Those decisions were very clear in stay home provisions in Victoria and have been clear in various jurisdictions over the time as they've implemented different um, health regulations as well, as they've been relevant to people with a disability. But you do have clients, I take it, supported independent living clients, who live in their own accommodation, not group homes? Um, yes, we do, yes. 
did your uh, organization impose restrictions on visitors to those people in their homes? My apologies. I understand your question now. My apologies, no. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Melifont again. No, pro no problem. Thank you, Commissioner. So, Mr. Richardson, I'll just return to my question, which was, was the oversight, what was the oversight mechanism for ensuring um, that the guidelines issued with respect to when restrictions could be placed and when they could not was, in fact, complied with? Uh, the main way was through reporting through the line of management and then our pandemic response team has had summary reports provided to it as well. So two prongs of oversight. I want to move to the question of PPE and ask you what challenges were faced by rumour services with respect to PPE during this pandemic? Major challenges. Uh, and the situation has improved steadily as agencies and ARUMA, um, as all organisations have learnt and built supply chains. So within ARUMA, we did not traditionally maintain a large central stock of high-grade PPE. So N95 masks, uh, face shields, uh, full gowns, etc. We had basic stocks at each home as needed, but we did not have a centralised supply chain. Um, as the pandemic broke in its early stages, as I think we're all aware, there was considerable shortage of PPE, both members of the general community and also for disability support organisations. We um, sought clarification from uh, government agencies, both federal and state, through novel panels about would we have access to higher grade PPE uh, through the national medical or state stockpiles uh, if we had an infection and it was very difficult to get a yes or no answer. It was typically no in the early stages and if it was yes, it was yes, but it will only depend if hospitals and aged care haven't used it all first. And so I think it's one of the learnings for all of us out of this process is the need to efficiently maintain adequate stocks of high grade PPE um, so that wherever there's an outbreak, be it hospital, be it aged care, be it in disability support, uh, there's sufficient access. It's certainly something we've changed our practice. So we now have pretty significant national stockpiles as supply has eased up, but it was a challenge uh, for the first month or two. And we're quite thankful that our first significant outbreak happened uh, more recently and hence we didn't have to put those rather tenuous supply chain options to the test at scale. Your response to the Commission, that is a rumour's response to the Commission, said that national PPE stockpiles were difficult to access due to the stockpiles being opened to disability services at a later stage than other health and aged care services. The application process and priority criteria also made PPE difficult to access. Does that speak about the, the deprioritisation you've just mentioned? Yes. I think there was a shortage of PPE across the country. Uh, government agencies were appropriately seeking to ration it until they could build stocks, but unfortunately they did not view disability support work as an essential service and therefore disability support work was well down the pecking order, if I can put it that way, in the potential to access those stockpiles. And you speak about the application process itself being a difficulty with access. What does that mean? Uh, I, I'm probably not the best person to give you details, but anecdotally what the staff have told me and some colleagues have told me is you would fill out, you'd be asked to fill out a form, then there would be a different form, you'd submit it electronically, you might never get a response, or you'd ring up someone and they'd say it should be state, not 
federal. So there was just no clarity of application for disability support organisations to get a guaranteed response. Okay. Uh, Ms Rob, the Life Without Barrier response to the Commission spoke of uh, access to PPE for the frontline disability workforce during the COVID-19 pandemic being initially extremely problematic. And you state that planning by health departments for priority access by the disability sector to PPE stockpiles would assist, provide and bring peace of mind to people with disability, their families and the disability workforce. Can you explain so far as you understand uh, uh, why priority access wasn't provided to disability uh, workforce and people with disability? Do you have an understanding of that? Um, so my understanding around the PPE is there was limited supply um, at, in those early days in March and um, early April in the country. Um, I then, um, I do think that uh, that had a relationship with the definition of whether disability services were essential services. That was certainly the understanding of the sector at the time, that that was a barrier. And I know that then there was a move for um, there to be preferential access to masks um, for people with disability and service providers from the stockpile. And that was a very positive step from the NDIA and government. I, I think that the reason that we've made the statement about um, the worry that people with a disability and providers have is because um, without having that um, essential status or whatever status you require to be able to access the PPE reliably. When a decision is made, like Victoria recently made around eye protection for um, disability support workers, then there's a flurry of activity to then be able to source that next PPE item. And I understandably that causes people with a disability, their family, carers and providers a lot of worry now but also when we look to the days and months ahead. I want to move now to the topic of PPE training. Ms Rob, what guidance was uh, Life Without Barriers, if any, provided by Commonwealth agencies or government with respect to training for your staff and your customers about the use of PPE? So in regards to guidance we would re receive from Commonwealth, that would... Um, come from the Safeguarding Commission, the National Safeguarding Commission. That generally comes in the form of alerts, which draw providers' attention to particular regulation changes or any other requirements that they need to be aware of. And it also provides links and sometimes hyperlinks or others to um, resources, be that videos or training material or um, toolkits that would be helpful for providers to then use to be able to train their staff. All right. Can I, can I get to the nitty-gritty of it? There was really no specific um, training, as I understand it, provided by Commonwealth agencies or governments, apart from some online resources, which would enable a trainer to see that the person being trained understood what they were being told, was putting the PPE on correctly, uh, was doing appropriate donning and doffing in appropriate locations. Is that your understanding? My, yeah, my understanding is that um, providers will be all using different resources because they'll be sourcing them from different places in an effort to try to find something that helps them and their staff. Some of them will have competency checks as part of that, which is what you're referring to, and some will not. And as far as I'm aware, there isn't um, one particularly approved or um, mandated um, training course um, across the sector at the moment, as far as I'm aware. Is that your understanding too, Mr Richardson? Yes. Okay. I want to 
then move to um, the set of guidelines called the Communicable Diseases Network Australia Coronavirus Disease 2019 Outbreaks in Residential Care Facilities CDNA National Guidelines for the Prevention, Control and Public Health Management of COVID-19 Outbreaks in Residential Care Facilities in Australia. You're both familiar with that document? I wouldn't claim familiarity, Dr Malafon. There are many documents that have guided us. Our teams have been familiar with them. I don't have personal familiarity. All right, Ms Roth. Um, uh, if, if this is the Residential Services Practice Guide, I'm just not familiar with the exact title, yeah. but if that's what this is, then I am yet yeah, familiar with the document. All right. If I can ask you both to take it from me <laughs> that the following is correct, that um, the COVID-19 information pack information for NDIS providers and workers um, encouraged providers of residential accommodation for disability accommodation settings to review those CDNA guidelines. And if you can accept from me that those guidelines make reference to things like clinical waste, diagnostic materials, um, residents having their own room with ensuite facilities, sections or areas of the facility which can be cut off. Can I ask you whether those things would uniformly apply across your residential facilities? Most certainly not. No, there's variability in the physical property design and layout in particular. I want to turn to the topic of community visitors. Ms Robin, in your statement, you say that restrictions were not placed on advocates or community visitors, including where the accommodation was situated in a hot spot. The requirement was that uh, the visitors adhere to visiting requirements of all visitors, for example, hand hygiene and social distance. Uh, can I ask you, did advocates and community visitors, to your knowledge, continue to visit your services in person um, during the pandemic at around the same level as pre-pandemic, or was there a reversion more to online community visits or telephone community visits? Some states, um, I, um, New South Wales, I think, and possibly Queensland, um, did move their community visitor program to telephone at a point in time and um, related to the national lockdown. Um, and other, other jurisdictions kept that face to face. And I'm not aware that any advocacy groups particularly changed the way that they then engaged with um, clients and both most certainly had access to Life Without Barriers um, clients. Okay, so um, Mr. Richardson, your statement refers to community uh, visitors visits being suspended, not, not by a rumour, but were suspended in New South Wales and Queensland, and that visits in those states moved to an online platform. I want to ask um, now. We're sorry. Let me preface this by saying that the commission has heard evidence in previous hearings about the critical importance of community visitors. Um, as a protective mechanism. I, wa I want to ask, Mr Richardson, first, were specific measures put in place to ensure that those online community visits could occur in circumstances of privacy and confidentiality? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, absolutely yes, in that I would strongly agree that community visitors are an important part of protecting the rights and wellbeing of our residents, uh, particularly people who don't have strong social and family networks. So the more independent people, be they community visitors, 
advocates for others who can visit in my mind the better. Okay. Ms. Rob, in Life Without Barriers, were specific mechanisms put in place to ensure privacy and confidentiality of community visits in that online forum? Um, certainly, I'm confident that we were clear that we wanted that to occur. And I know that we definitely purchased um, additional equipment to enable that if it was to be done by telephone or tablet form. Um, I'm not clear of the specifics around the privacy and confidentiality, but I would with some confidence um, think that our staff would know how to facilitate that. Okay. Um, with those qualifications, you would agree with the uh, critical importance of ensuring privacy and confidentiality in those settings? Almost certainly. And that's something which organisations such as yours should ensure happens and is audited to make sure there's compliance. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. And Mr Richardson, do you agree with that? Yes. I think we. it's uh, with one rider, I guess, just to be transparent, that community visitors look at a whole home and the dynamics of a whole home and the behaviours of staff that they observe as well as meet with individual people and that's really important too and uh, often often those type of prompts tell you more than someone putting a file or or whatever it may be so subject to that yes clearly privacy of any relationship and discussion between a community visitor or advocate and a resident is fundamentally important okay can i move now to the general topic of um, pandemic and COVID 19 planning is it the case, Ms. Robs, that Life Without Barriers um, hadn't run, test run a pandemic or infectious disease plan prior to COVID-19? So we had a very comprehensive emergency management plan and we did test run that. And we then fine tuned that with the bushfires and um, the floods also over the um, Christmas period. Um, within that, there was a lot of mechanisms that were consistent with a pandemic management plan. But when we started to realise the potential impact of COVID-19 in March, we chose to have a specific COVID-19 pandemic management plan. And at that time, we obviously hadn't tested that, although we certainly had tested our emergency management plan, which had a lot of very similar um, components. So leadership, communication, decision making, we're all in the, the emergency management plan. Okay, so but I am correct in saying, aren't I, that the emergency response plan prior to March 2020, that is the March 2020 pandemic plan, did not include specific planning for a pandemic situation. Correct. Is that correct? Um, and we have, of course, um, in relatively recent history, been through the, the swine flu pandemic. Uh, were, to your knowledge, any particular steps taken in consequence of that pandemic with respect to emergency response? So the part of our emergency response plan that related to, most related to a pandemic, um, the reason that we didn't think it was um, as relevant in the COVID piece, because that was generally where we assumed it would be confined more geographically or by particular groupings. So it was more around infectious disease, not what we expected the COVID-19 um, to be. So in that way, there was an infectious disease part of the emergency management plan, but it wasn't sufficient for what we thought we were going to need for COVID-19 um, at all. And in respect of that infectious disease component, those infectious disease components of the emergency response plan, that wasn't the subject of a specific test run prior to pandemic? No, it was not. No. Okay. Mr Richardson, same questions to you. Um, is it correct to say that a rumours emergency response plan um, prior to January 2020 did not include specific planning for a pandemic situation? Yes, that's correct. And is it correct to say, therefore, that prior to um, 
since the COVID pandemic, a rumour hadn't test run a pandemic or infectious disease plan. Yes, that would be true. And as with Life Without Barriers, uh, we made the decision to take our enterprise crisis management plan and build a specific pandemic response plan uh, off the back of that in late March that was completed. But, yeah, up until then, we had tested our emergency uh, response plan and it had been very live through bushfires and floods in the months before, but it did not have a specific pandemic response component. And, um, again, the swine flu question, that didn't, that didn't trigger specific attention to pandemic planning or infectious disease planning for your emergency response plan, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, can I ask you, each of you, have you, you, that is, your organisation, ever been audited or assessed uh, in relation to pandemic or infectious diseases or outbreak management plans um, by the NDIA, NDIS, QSC or Commonwealth Department? Not to my knowledge, no. No, I would say the same. I'm not aware that there's a specific um, being a requirement around that. Okay. And to your knowledge, has the Commonwealth Government um, or any Commonwealth agency, including uh, the QSC and the, and the NDIA, made any checks with your organisations about whether you have a pandemic or infectious disease outbreak management plan? Same answer, not to my knowledge. Ms Rob? Um, well, look, we have had our plan requested from a number of external government departments. I couldn't be sure if the Safeguarding Commission was one of those, but certainly we have been asked for our plan from a number of authorities. From a number of, sorry? Government departments, sorry. Okay. And the details of that something that we could ask you to check on at, at a convenient time? Of course, of course, yes. All right. Um, now... You're each aware uh, that there's a requirement to notify uh, the NDIS QSC of a confirmed worker or participant infection, correct? Yes. Okay. And yes, Ms. Rob? Yes. Okay. And it's the case, isn't it, that each of your organisations have made um, notifications pursuant to that requirement from time to time, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, now, and, and as we heard earlier, um, Ms. Rob, Life Without Barriers has had a number of infections and so there's, there has consequently been quite a number of notifications to the QSC. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, has the QSC provided any specific advice or required uh Life Without Barriers to take any specific action as a result um, of those notifications being made? No, not that I'm aware of to date. And Mr Richardson, same question to you. Uh, no, we did receive correspondence from the Commission uh, regarding the non-submission of some notifications but that was subsequently withdrawn as one of the complexities at the moment is that in Victoria, where, as we all know, the, the bulk of COVID outbreaks have been, uh, there are supported independent living services that are still under the regulatory control of the state government, not the NDISC. And so our outbreaks in July were in that setting and therefore the reporting obligation amongst the several reporting obligations was to the Victorian state government, not to the NDISC. Okay, so can I take it from both of you to, that that all means that there's been no specific advice from any Commonwealth department or agency to do anything in re relation to any of the confirmed infections of workers or participants or impact on your facilities or your operation. Is that correct? Yes. 
Uh, and sorry, just to clarify, Dr. Melfont, did you say Commonwealth Government? Commonwealth Government. Yes, that's and, correct. And Commonwealth. In the state government, but not Commonwealth. Okay. I want to turn um, briefly to the topic of the workforce. And this is dealt with in both of your statements, so I won't re-traverse what is there. But, um, Ms. Rob, you, your statement identifies the um, risks which can be pre presented by casual workers working across a number of different locations and that uh, Life Without Barriers are trying to take steps to reduce the amount of times that that work, that that occurs. And um, from the information provided, for example, uh, in respect of some of the um, uh, positive infections in COVID, workers at those locations, a number of them worked across a number of locations at the relevant times. Uh, can you speak to um, the, the challenges involved in having a casual workforce in the disability sector? Yes, so the challenges of having a casual workforce um, existed before COVID, so before the pandemic. Um, and really the challenges there are having the right balance to be able to have um, flexibility for your staffing, balanced with um, continuity of care and a familiar team and people in the home. And part of that is being able to attract and retain staff that want to make disability care a career for them. Within the pandemic, though, that really has been exacerbated because the um, when a house has a suspected or a positive case, we often then have to isolate entire staff teams, which can be up to 12 people, possibly. And then we have to be able to bring in additional staffing who have not had contact with that house. And really in that um, situation, we often do rely heavily on casuals. And then those casuals are by means um, of the fact that they are casual and not permanently on a roster, often do work across several locations, which we know is something we want to reduce. So it's a really a fine balance between being able to maintain the agility and yet stability that we want within those rosters in group homes, but knowing that at any point we need to have access to the surge workforce if indeed we do have an infection and we need to self-isolate a whole group of staff. And to be honest, that is actually very logistically challenging for organisations to work out how to do that and how to do that in consultation with clients and families and, of course, the industrial requirements around staff. Mr Richardson, I want to ask you the same question but and preface it by observing that um, whilst um, about 26% of your staff are casual, um, at Pasco Vale, where there was a um, COVID positive case, around six of 11 Aruma's employees were casual with another five agency staff. Can you speak again, same question, the, the, the challenges faced by uh, casual staff? Certainly. Um, I support Claire's comments to start with, so I won't repeat those. Um, at Aruma, one of the extra challenges that we've faced in Victoria uh, as we've taken over services from the Victorian state government last year, which includes the uh, home at Pasco Vale, um, there have been early retirement programs available to the staff who are currently still government employees until the end of the year and also hiring freezes. So that has exacerbated the challenge of having a full complement of largely permanent staff in supported living settings, which is our preference. Uh, in addition to Claire's comments, 
I would add another challenge around casual staff is that whilst we have knowledge of where they've worked on our account, you are never quite sure of where they may have worked on other people's account and we are not legally able to oblige them to disclose that to us. So there's some extra challenges. Uh, and the final comment I would add would be that the, the funding model under the NDIS, which is a, a wonderful and very welcome reform, does tend to drive a more fragmented and casualized workforce in order to maintain sufficiently high levels of staff utilization to be able to provide a service for the level of funding available, particularly in flexible support type settings. Before I proceed with a few more questions for each of you, can I just indicate, indicate to the commissioners that I probably have another five to 10 minutes of questions and then could I ask for a very brief break um, and, and then to, to hand most likely directly over to the commissioners if that's convenient. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rob, can I start with you? With the, the benefit of hindsight, uh, and hindsight's a very fine thing, what would you do differently? Um, so with, with the benefit of hindsight, one of the first things I referred to earlier was around our support for people who English is not their first language. And, um, and that definitely is something that we needed to do better and need to do better. The second one is that um, in the urgency to act and to try to communicate for the, our clients and our families, we did more communication than we did consultation. So I appreciate that for all of our teams, there was an urgency to act and it was confusing and people were doing their best, but actually in hindsight, I think we could have done better to put consultation mechanisms in so that we actually better balanced consultation and communication with our clients and their families. And the third piece in hindsight is that we have worked really hard to have a thorough and comprehensive response to suspected and positive cases. In hindsight, it really would have been good to have more nursing and medical support that we've received recently in Victoria to some of the positive matters. And actually that would be would have been more helpful in those previous matters and certainly something we want to be doing better into the future. Thank you. Mr Richardson, the same question to you, please. Yes. Um, I'd, I'd observe up front, we have learned a lot, as has everybody. So, uh, there's several lessons that we've already learned. For example, we've already discussed having a specific pandemic response plan. That's clearly something that we will maintain as an organisation. Uh, like Life Without Barriers, uh, we will work to refine our communications. And uh, sorry, Dr. Moulton. We... Please keep going. Yeah. Just lost a piece of paper. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, we would work to refine our um, communications. Uh, as well, particularly around um, cold and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and consultation, I think we did that well at the micro level. We want to look at ways we can consult better at the macro level. Another important area for us would be to improve our sort of workforce design, both at an establishment level and surge level. I mentioned before in Victoria, we're still seeking to build to the, right, the workforce we want going forward. But um, we want to reduce the number of sites on average at which staff work. That's a real juggle that impacts people's well-being, their lifestyles, our industrial obligations, but we're working through that. Um, I think we've been very happy with our rapid response team process uh, who've led the on-the-ground response. We would document that um, more strongly in advance, capture information in advance for volunteers and profiles. Um, so 
we would like to have those more easily ready to turn on in any location, including country cross borders. Um, we would apply the lessons that we've learned, I think, to improve a whole lot of policies, protocols, staff training, infection control. I think this unfortunate experience of the pandemic that we're all going through has helped us raise the bar across the board on infection control and droplet measures, for example. We want to maintain a higher standard going forward. Um, pragmatically, every time we have a COVID notification, we need to capture a great deal of information for, agent, for our own look back and tracing, as well as for government agencies. There are six notifications to various government agencies we need to make every time there's a, a, a positive case. So we actually update our systems and forms to automate more of that. Um, and then there's a whole lot of practical things. We never thought through how, how do you support your residents in a deep cleaning exercise when you're not allowed to be in the house while it's being deep cleaned or it ruins the efficacy of it. And so there are a whole lot of little practical things as well. Uh, and probably the, the two final ones I'd add, and they're related. One is we would allocate a whole lot more administrative response, um, administrative support to our response teams. The administrative load of responding to a pandemic through ro sudden roster redesign, surge staff sourcing, local communications, look back tracing, managing the access restrictions, consulting, isolating quarantine. It, it is a heavy administrative burden. And the related point around that is we have some incredibly capable and dedicated staff doing amazing things as they really do work incredibly hard to keep our customers and each other safe. They're at risk of burnout. And so we don't have an answer, but we do want to work out how we address staff exhaustion and potential burnout through a crisis like this that is going for such an extended period of time. Thank you. Thank you both for that. I'm going to ask this is my last question to each of you. It's going to be double barreled, which lawyers are not supposed to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. And it's this. I want to ask you what your wish list would be, your wish list to Commonwealth governments and agencies moving forward. And, and in the context of that, I want to ask you about whether it's okay from your perspective just to carry across aged care guidelines or do you need a bespoke response for the disability sector? Ms Rob? I'll take the second question first, if that's okay, because that's easier to answer. And that is we definitely need bespoke. The disability sector is not a subsection of the aged care sector. And although there are similarities, there are obvious differences as well. And I think that really needs to be acknowledged at all levels of government and into that in practical operational directions as well. Um, included all the way through to the national pandemic plan and the consideration of people with a disability within that. So no, we can't just take aged care guidelines and have the word disability and then they're fit for purpose. It takes more than that. Um, to respond to your first question, I had a wish list. I would like us to um, make things, some things better now and some things will take a little bit longer. I think now, in hearing um, some of the witness statements from this um, commission also, and in my own experience, I think we have to address the PPE supply and cost. Um, it is causing stress. It's not that government aren't trying to help or other people aren't, but it is a real worry and I think it can be fixed. I think we need to deal with the, the ongoing confusion around information and guidelines provided on what to do and how to keep people safe. Again, everyone is trying and everyone critiques communication, but I really think that we need to keep our eye on the clear, simple and practical directions 
for people with disability and providers to be able to follow. And I do not believe that we've hit the mark on that, not for want of trying. I also think that there needs to be more support provided to providers. We can't expect all providers um, to be able to know exactly what to do to support people through this pandemic. We have not experienced it before. We can't possibly know everything we have to do. And if you have both a rumor and Life Without Barriers on here as large providers with resources and relationships to lean on, and we have struggled, then I think we need to um, work out between Commonwealth government, state government, and the sector has to step up here in a leadership role too. What do we need to do so that we share resources, share information, actually have a very assertive response to positive cases that people can rely on? And that we together consider the workforce challenges that Andrew spoke well to and consider the challenges around training and supply and um, particularly surge workforce too. And what are we doing so that people with a disability are supported by workers who know they're valued and properly compensated and supported for their work? If you could indulge me once more before one, one more point before I go to Andrew. I also think that in the longer term, I work, I work closely with um, Commonwealth and state governments um, in the panels and groups that you mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, and generally in my role because we're a larger organization. And I know that they are working really hard. I know they are. I think that one of the things in hindsight that I would really have on my wish list is that we establish an operating model for us all for a pandemic. We had an operating model developing for the NDIS before we came into the pandemic around the roles of the Commonwealth government, safeguarding commission, state government, the sector, and how all of that needed to come together and where the voice and views of people with a disability and their families sat front and center in that. Now we were only just developing that because that is new in the NDIS, although it's been around for a few years, it's still new. I think we brought that into the pandemic and it's not fit for purpose as an operating model. So my wish list would be that we're able to have a proper coordinated operating model for a pandemic with all of those agencies with clear roles clear um, guidance and communication and a coordinated approach so that we don't have people with a disability, their families, workers and organisations experiencing the level of stress and anxiety that they have and that all of the government efforts are targeted to the things that really will make a difference. Thank you. Mr Richardson, I'll move to you. I'm going to ask you a global question first. Do you agree or disagree with what Ms. Rob just said? Uh, the global question uh, comment would be I broadly agree. Okay. Now please answer it yourself. Okay. Um, and, and thank you for asking Claire to go first because it does give me a little chance to scribble down a few things. But I would like to make the point quite strongly first that disability support is fundamentally different to residential aged care and it needs a specific approach, it can't just adopt an aged care approach. We're supporting people over a much longer time horizon typically, uh, people of all ages. Someone with a disability may need support for 80 years plus. So it is quite a different context. It's much more about choice, control, human rights and all aspects of life, not just accommodation, it's relationships, it's work, it's education and learning its community engagement, uh, and in contrast to residential, residential aged care, uh, people with disability, except those who are unfortunate enough to still be living in residential aged care, live either on their own or in family groups or in small uh, group settings such as supported independent living. It is a very, very different model. And the other reason why I think it needs a very different policy approach is that the focus primarily should be 
on prevention and best practice, not just on response and a health response. And so um, disability support organisations such as Aruma and Life Without Barriers and many others would really value additional help and guidance and support to minimise the risk of people um, contracting COVID-19 or other infectious diseases in the first place. And to provide that type of practice support, it's a very different context to a, a, a residential aged care model. So apologies for the long list. I'll, I'll try and go quicker on my wish list. Uh, the, first, the, the first is simply a disability sector specific, nationally consistent, well, response, uh, well resourced response to this and any future pandemic. So things like a single source of truth and information, not conflicting information from multiple agencies at both federal and state level. Um, it's not fun chasing the hyperlinks, trying to find out something, you end up back where you started. Um, I think we need clear, consistent direction as part of that for both providers and people with disability. Uh, we've talked about day program and other type of things that were very confusing. As I said, we want a proactive focus on keeping people well, on infection prevention, on upskilling, not just responding when they're sick, um, and a range of strategies under that to mitigate risk. Uh, you touched before on the usage of high-end PPE. Our staff are not normally trained or expected to safely use high-end PPE, and there are a range of other things under that. Uh, as part of that disability support work must be recognised as an essential service. It is fundamentally disrespectful to people with a disability to think otherwise. And we've heard some of the stories already over the past couple of days why that is just so critical. Uh, that would bring with it things like guaranteed access to appropriate PPE, uh, priority access to testing for staff and customers. Yeah, people can turn away from testing trying to do the right thing. Uh, ease of travel during lockdowns and across borders and the like, ability to purchase essential supplies when there's rationing. Um, the third thing I think we should have in addition to that consistent response and essential service classification is access to scalable outbreak teams, expert advice and specialist in-home testing as a matter of course available in all jurisdictions. I commend the Victorian government for their work in that area over the past couple of months and suggest that's a potential model that should be consistently rolled out across the country. Um, I agree strongly with Claire that we need a different or at least a complementary funding mechanism to support organisations in a pandemic context. Uh, we love the NDIS. It's a great social reform for people with disability, but at the end of the day, a piece rate, fixed price, transactional market model for the provision of human services such as disability support tends to break down in a pandemic. Um, and finally, I would argue that we need a plan to support people with disability to reintegrate back into the community, to be fully included again in economic life and in their communities as we head into recovery and whatever the new normal may be. And it strikes me that the National Disability Strategy, which is due to be renewed and in a consultation process at the moment, really could be a vehicle both for upping the ante in terms of uh, a dedicated targeted response to future pandemics, but also in planning for this very difficult journey that a lot of people with disability are now going to have to go through as they seek to re-engage with the workforce or re-engage with the community or with education or whatever it may be. So quite a long shopping list, but thank you for asking me. All right, thank you. Chair, might we adjourn briefly? Um, I'll do my very best to aim for 4.15, if that's okay. We can. What, what's going to happen between 4.10 and 4.15? Can I just have a moment? All right, I've just been advised that we don't need the break and can I hand over to the commissioners for any questions of these witnesses? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Bennett. <coughs>
thank you both. Um, I'd like to um, first ask Mr. Mr. Richardson, in your submission, there were questions six and seven um, that you answered on page six and seven of your submission. And questions six and seven were going to uh, go to um, restrictions on the way people, the residents of the group homes lived and what restrictions you placed on them. Your answers, in fact, go to quarantining, what you did when there was a quarantining. Um, I want to know was if there was no um, cases of, as set out in six to, question six, confirmed infections or international travel or contact, were there any other restrictions that limited change the freedom of movement of residents within their homes and within the um, community in accordance to what other citizens were allowed to have? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. The, the broad answer is mostly no and a little bit of yes, so apologies for that. Um, we strive to maintain all of our residents as having the same rights as any other member of the community. One of the challenges is that when you have people living together and someone is uh, suspected or confirmed of having COVID-19, then it's in everybody's interest to impose um, self-isolation or if someone has um, COVID then quarantine. And within a group living setting, depending on the nature of the physical property, that can be quite a challenge. So in some instances, we have had to restrict some people to this part of the house and other people to that part of the house. It's easy when people, there might be a couple of villas in a, or a few units that make up a supported living setting, but when it's a more tra traditional house, that's when we have imposed additional restrictions to help people isolate or quarantine, as the case may be. I, I understand that if there was a suspicion suspicion, a suspected case or someone was not well, but if all the people in the bubble were still, you know, no sign of something that was as set out as what required, to, were they still able to exercise, to move within their home, um, to go out to the restricted shopping if they wanted to? Did that occur? Uh Yes, Commissioner, it did, consistent with the uh, care facilities directions enforced from time to time, which did restrict some of those activities and the number of people and duration um, of visits and those type of things. And those restrictions, they were in accordance, you said, to sort of public health orders. With, for, for, for group homes, were they the, the, for the residents in those homes, were they the public health orders that applied um, to the broader community or were, because I've read through some of the attachments and I haven't been able to find what you've provided, restrictions about saying that someone um, should stay in their room um, unless there is a possibility of a sickness waiting for a test result, a confirmed case. We've heard here that um, there were some homes where people were um, just just told to stay in their rooms. And you're I was saying that... Confident, no, I'm confident that that was only in cases where there was a suspected or actual case of COVID-19 in the home, either them or another resident. And they would have been reported to um, the um, Quality and Safeguards Commission? I'm As actually incidents? not sure, Commissioner. I apologise. Could I take that question on notice? Okay. Um, Miss Robbie, you, were, um, you said you were much clearer. You said to question six and seven, no, um, which is page nine of your submission. <laughs> you just said no. <laughs> Uh, so it was it's a no. very Mr Richardson mm. um, you might want to but um, so you're saying that 
unless there was a confirmed case awaiting a test um, or that there'd been conf um, contact, which could have been, you know, through a family member or some concern, you made no restrictions on the residents in their own homes. Correct. Accommodation. And did that include them being able to go out to exercise if the rest of the community was able to and to go yep. shopping? Yes, the same as the rest of the community. Um, thank you. Commissioner Galbally, do you have a question? We can't hear you, so... Um, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have heard, as you no doubt are aware, of uh, concerns expressed by people with disability about the casualisation of workforces uh, for of the workforce for carers, um, and that includes people, of course, in group homes, people in their own homes sometimes. Um, I have seen the answers on the proportion of the workforce that uh, are casual employees, so that in the case um, of uh, Mr Richardson, I think you indicate that a rumour has... 26% of its group home workforce are casual employees. And of those, 23% have been employed for less than six months. And there is a gross turnover of casual staff of 32% per year. Um, why is there such a high proportion of the workforce that uh, are employed as casuals? Uh, primarily, I think, as we said before, because it is tough to recruit staff to do disability support work. So our preference as an organisation is in supported living to always hire permanent staff. And we routinely survey all our casual staff to um, ask if they wish to convert to either permanent part-time or permanent full-time status. A lot of workers might be university students, for example, doing an allied health degree where it's actually good for them, I think, for their professional and career development to work in disability support for a period. Um, and whilst the, the percentage of workers is high, the actual percentage of hours worked, as you'd understand, is considerably lower, simply because casuals on average work uh, substantially fewer hours than a permanent member of staff. Did you um, observe or your staff observe the kind of anxiety that has been referred to in the evidence among people with disability because of uh, the uh, discontinuity in carers for group homes and perhaps in other forms of accommodation as well? Uh, yes, I'm not aware, Commissioner, of any instance where we haven't provided a service, um, but there is a lot of concern, a lot of worry, and as... Um, Claire mentioned a little while ago, as soon as you have uh, a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19 in your staff, then suddenly a whole staff team needs to be isolated, a new staff brought in. And whilst we do our best, they will not know the customers or have such strong relationships with the customers as the staff that they know better and are more comfortable with. So there's, there's a high degree of stress and worry I think amongst a significant proportion of frontline staff and also people with a disability who we're supporting as they navigate the coronavirus. Chair, could I follow up on the casualisation question? Um, Casualised workers are not entitled to sick leave and holiday pay and those arrangements. So particularly sick leave, if they're not well, they don't get paid. Um, where if they were permanent part-time workers, they could have agreed hours, but they would be entitled to those um, employee benefits, wouldn't they? Absolutely. Have you looked at a model where increasing your permanent part-time workforce um, could bring stability and make those workers feel, feel more secure um, during such an issue as a pandemic or other emergency situation? Yes, and um, 
we do very genuinely seek to encourage casual staff to convert to permanent part-time um, or full-time if they wish, but permanent part-time would be the normal path. Uh, for a variety of reasons, it could be the 25% loading. More often it's lifestyle and flexibility with family or studies when you know, courses change each semester and the like. Uh, a lot of people don't accept that. I would, however, note that we have introduced a special leave policy at Aruma and we do give casuals with at least three months service now two weeks of paid pandemic leave because the risk of having people turn up to work when they don't feel well because they're trying to pay the rent and feed the family is just too high. How many of your workforce are permanent part-time and how many are permanent full-time? Um, we have, I'm think, I can't think of the numbers off the top of my head, but it's approximately twice as many staff are permanent part-time as permanent full-time. So we would prefer that ratio to be the other way and we're seeking to move it there over time. And consequentially reduce your casual workforce? and agency workforce? Yes, yes. Our goal would be to have absolutely no agency workforce. It's a goal that we have not yet achieved. I was going to ask you what measures you took to alleviate the anxiety that people with disability in your residential homes were experiencing by reason of these extraordinary events occurring during the pandemic. Um, a range of ways and again when there's an ongoing relationship uh, between stable staff and our residents and that's a huge help and when that relationship includes a strong circle of support so friends and families and others in a person's life but but one thing that we have done is make extensive use of social stories for example to help people understand in in pictorial and very simple English storytelling ways, why you might wear a mask or what it's like to have a COVID test or why you can't do this or you can do that. So there's no perfect response, but we've pursued a range of ways as best we can to help people feel as comfortable as they can. I was really directing attention to the specific forms of anxiety and stress associated with discontinuity in staffing that uh, would follow, for example, when uh, people, staff members had to isolate themselves or were removed for some reason from the uh, roster. Uh, the evidence indicates that this was something that people with disability find, often found, have found extremely stressful and difficult. Was there any form of support in relation to mental, mental health? Uh, we have a free uh, employee and customer assistance line that people can call if they want advice uh, or just have a confidential conversation. The challenge with that is that that's not necessarily readily accessible to a significant proportion of our customers who may not feel able or comfortable to make those type of contacts. I think the other thing that we've sought to do is to maintain as much continuity as we can. So one of the benefits of having casuals who've worked across more than one service, for example, is that they do become known to a broader cohort than staff who only work at one service. And typically, um, particularly in Pasco Vale, where a major infection location to date has been, um, to have the coordinators and managers and other people practice advisors and the like who those people know still in their lives has helped, but it's an incomplete answer. It's a challenge. Yes. Um, can I ask you, Ms. Robs, to address the same questions? I notice that uh, your statement indicates, uh, if anything, a higher ratio of casualised workforce and a turnover of 40%. Do you... Do you um, give the same answers in effect uh, uh, that uh, Mr Richardson gave as to why those figures are as they are? 
Um, yes, I, I would agree um, with um, Andrew's comments. And the only piece I may add is just to put um, some more fact around Andrew's comment about the hours work, that the casual numbers are high on headcounts. Um, uh, the average hours worked by permanent workers in Life Without Barriers is 85%. So although the casual numbers are high on headcounts, they don't represent a large percentage of the hours worked across our group living program. Um, and the only other piece that may be helpful to build on Andrew's comments, um, which I agree with, are that we have also taken steps really from experience for positive cases in Victoria to intentionally um, make sure that for every house, we have a staff member who knows all of the clients within that home. Um, they, we picked one for each house and uh, relocated them to another house or another duty so that in the event that there is a positive case in that house, we know that we're able to put someone into that home that knows those clients really well to be able to provide that um, guidance and support to whatever team come in if we do need to isolate the rest of the staff in that house. And that's something that we're hoping helps manage the understandable anxiety for clients when the house staff are isolated, people are wearing PPE in the home and they don't have familiar faces around them which we perfectly understand must be very stressful. In the schedule uh, to uh, your uh, further, your witness statement, I think there are 10, uh, or perhaps more, 11 or so, case, uh, examples where a staff member tested positive at uh, one of the group homes, and then there was a process of testing staff members and uh, residents who had come in contact in some way with the staff member who had tested positive. I assess from uh, the information being provided, as it happened, uh, nearly all the tests of staff members and residents proved to be negative. But during the period of testing and waiting for results and so forth must have been extraordinarily difficult for residents. Oh. But what... What what steps specifically were taken in these uh, 11 instances to alleviate that stress, that anxiety that, uh, and I take it that some of these people were people with cognitive uh, disabilities? Yes. So from the point where there's a suspected matter, so someone goes off to be tested, be that a client or a staff member, then we do then... Um, ask all of the staff to wear PPE as though it was a positive case. And that's part of our efforts to enable people to move around the home freely, um, but actually be able to keep clients and staff as safe as possible from further infection. Now, that understandably raises concerns for the clients because it's, they're supported by someone with masks and gowns and everything on. So the things we've been trying so far is really talking with all of the clients before that ever happens and for the last few months about what that's like, showing them the PPE, letting them wear the PPE if they want to, looking at staff in PPE and trying to really explain to them about why and how that's going to work and using um, the um, easy English tools or other communication methods that are really best for those particular individuals, really just trying to give them a sense of what might happen to try to mitigate some of that anxiety. And then we've also got videos of people in those homes to show people so they know what it might actually be like um, if it happens. Then when it does happen, we do work really hard with the incoming staff and with the families supported by those um, technology and digital tools to recognise that there'll be heightened anxiety for clients. One of the things that makes us think we've been somewhat successful on that, notwithstanding it must be very difficult, is that we actually wondered if we'd see an escalation in the reporting about um, anxiety-driven behaviours from some residents if their house was isolated. And we have not experienced that in the houses 
that have been isolated and wearing PPE. So we're hopeful that that's a sign that there's not um, behaviours resulting from that anxiety of, of concern for those residents. Do you have staff who are specifically trained to address this kind of exceedingly, dif I imagine, exceedingly difficult situation, whether they be psychologists, social workers or other with, uh, others with specific experience and training in um, assisting people with disability in these kinds of stressful situations? So we do have staff within Life Without Barriers and we also do access services with those sorts of expertise external to Life Without Barriers too, so clinical services and counselling services as well. And we certainly encourage them to be accessed um, at, at any time that the clients need and particularly um, through this lockdown period and um, if clients do have to self-isolate. Were any of those services utilised in the 11 cases that are referred to in the schedule? Um, I would hope so, but I might need to take that on notice um, and, and, and check that, but I, I would certainly hope so. If you wouldn't mind checking that, that would be quite helpful. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, and, and just if I can follow up, Mr Richardson, I, we're getting very late and I think it's probably time for us to... <laughs> terminate the proceedings for today but uh, the same sort of question to you uh, are there were, were resources of that kind available to you in similar situations and were they utilized uh, and a very similar answer to Claire's response we are more dependent on external clinicians clinicians and therapists but we do have a small internal cater um, who provided that type of support um, the other thing I would flag just for clarity is that not everyone in the staff team at a house when there is a suspected or confirmed case needs to um, self-isolate because of the nature of shift work and patterns. It's nearly always a subset of the house have not had recent contact. So there is that extra level of continuity which can assist. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Melifont, is there anything else that you would like to ask, perhaps arising no. out of those questions? Nothing further, thank you. Now, is there any of uh, 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 the representatives of uh, the uh, two organisations from which we have heard, is there anything that you wish to uh, contribute to our discussion? Uh, nothing from me. Thank you, Commissioners, on behalf of Aruma. Thank you. Yes, nothing from me either. Thank you, Commissioners, on behalf of Life Without Barriers. Thank you very much. All right, does that mean, Dr Melifont, that uh, we can conclude the proceedings for today? Yes, and see you at 9.30 in the morning. And what time are we resuming in the morning? 9.30. No rest for the wicked. <laughs> None right, indeed. Thank you, thank you very much. We'll adjourn until 9.30 tomorrow. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.